In the trial, this is the case of People versus Lyle Menendez. He is in court with his attorney, both attorneys, and the people are represented, and our jury is in the courtroom. Hi. As, I think you're entitled to an explanation. <laughs> oh, no, not this one. <laughs> uh, well, because you've been so good and patient, we put you in the jury box. How's that? <laughs> um, the estimates that uh, we've had in regards to when we would be finished with the other witness uh, involving the other defendant took a, were incorrect, and it took longer, much longer than I had been informed what it would take, and. Uh, it finally concluded this afternoon, so we're now ready to start up with you folks. And we'll uh, be in session, uh, the balance of today and tomorrow and Friday morning. Friday afternoon, one of the jurors uh, on your panel has to be elsewhere, so we won't be in session Friday afternoon, but we'll be with you the balance of the week until Friday afternoon, and um, um, only you will be here. The other jury will not be here for the balance of the week. Um, it's important uh, that you not be concerned about uh, what uh, occurs in the courtroom when the other jury is in the courtroom and you're not in the courtroom because, uh, as I've told you many times, you must make your decision based only on the evidence presented to you in the trial while you're in the courtroom and uh, the instructions I give you on the law. Um, What we'll do now is proceed with um, the testimony for the defendant Eric Menendez, or strike that, the defendant Lyle Menendez. You'll see Eric Menendez in the courtroom as well, but uh, his jury is not, and you should be aware that this testimony is only being received as to the defendant uh, for whom you will make a decision, that is the defendant Lyle Menendez. All right, um, is the defense ready to proceed? We are All right, you may call your next witness. Thank you. The defense calls Dr. Stuart Hart. Please raise your right hand. You do solve this record the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Please take a stand and seek your name for the record. Stuart Newton Hart. H A R T. And your first name? Stuart S T U A R T. All right. Dr. Hart, uh, where are you currently employed? Uh, Indiana University. And what do you do there? I'm a professor there. I teach courses, I conduct research, carry out service. What types of courses do you teach? A uh, variety. Uh, most of them uh, recently have been had to do with uh, child abuse and neglect. I teach a child abuse and neglect course for educators. I teach a seminar, graduate seminar in psychological maltreatment. Uh, I'm presently teaching a child development and children's rights course, and frequently I teach basic educational psychology courses for those who are becoming educators. There's a much wider range of courses I've taught over the years, but those are the ones I emphasize now. How long have you been teaching? I've been at Indiana University since 1971. I was teaching in public schools uh, before that, since 1961, I suppose. I think. And how long have you had a specialty in the area of child abuse? That really developed um, in the early portion of, 1980, of the 1980s, although in a sense uh, working with, as a psychologist uh, for years before that, I had to give consideration to conditions associated with child abuse. Did you have a clinical practice? I had a clinical practice uh, with a, a corporation of uh, uh, a psychological corporation or a, uh, a service corporation, yes, in Indianapolis. And uh, who did you treat in that practice? Did you treat children or Children adults? and work with their families. And were these on abuse and family issues that you dealt with? Uh, this well, population? over the years, including uh, in the work with schools and consulting with schools and a variety of other agencies. 
Are you hearing voices? Uh, yeah, well, I thought I was hearing something. <laughs> uh, uh, I've worked with families, certainly, in which uh, the, uh, the psychological treatment has been destructive. Yeah. And you have... Um, a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in the area of psychology and education, yeah. is that correct? That's right. And in your, um, your work at the university now, are you the director of the Office for the Study of Psychological Rights of the Children? Of the, of child, the child, yes. And can you tell me what that is? Uh, that, uh, the center was developed following the International Year of the Child in 1979. I chaired the task, International Task Force that developed the Declaration for the Psychological Rights of the Child and brought that back to the United States and my university and a national association decided that we needed a national center to be concerned about uh, children's rights issues. And so it's a center that conducts research that reviews um, literature of a variety of kinds that works with professionals and specialists all over the country to try to clarify uh, children's rights issues and uh, child abuse and neglect issues. And do you hold any professional licenses? Uh, yes, as a psychologist in the uh, state of Indiana. May still, I, th I think I may still have a teacher's license too, but I'm not absolutely sure. And do you serve as a, a consultant occasionally in addition to teaching and chairing various organizations? Yes. And have you served on a number of committees, task, for, task force, etc., with regard to prevention of child abuse, identifying child abuse, defining certain types of child abuse? Yes. And were you a committee member of the National Committee on the, for the Prevention of Child Abuse? I worked on their uh, committee or subcommittees dealing with psychological maltreatment uh, and, and participated in the development of uh, different forms of published communication, yes. And have you done some work on an international basis in this area? I've uh, made presentations on the topic of psychological maltreatment uh, in other parts of the world and I've done a lot of children's rights work. And are you currently involved in an organization uh, that is connected with the United Nations? Yes, I'm a representative to the non-governmental organizations uh, for the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, an organization that helped uh, in part uh, to draft uh, sections of the, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and it continues to work to see that the convention is implemented effectively around the world. It's made up of uh, uh, many kinds of uh, professional and child-oriented organizations. And does that group meet periodically? It uh, generally meets twice a year. And has it met twice this year? Yeah, I think it's actually met more than twice this year, but um, because it works very close, it, it tries to coordinate its meetings with the meetings of the United Nations Committee for the Rights of the Child, and uh, I believe it has met more than uh, once in the last year. And did you recently return from such a meeting? Yes. And where was that meeting held? In uh, Geneva, Switzerland. And who else is a member of that particular group? So mm, there are numbers. Save the Children, uh, International Catholic Child Bureau, uh, the uh, Defense for Children International, and uh, a wide variety of other organizations that are. Are there representatives of other countries? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they represent particularly international organizations, non-governmental organizations, but the people who come there uh, come from uh, all over the world to represent those organizations. And in the past, have you served as the regional director for the National Association of School Psychologists? Yes. And have you been president of the National Association of School Psychologists? Yes. And did you chair the Child Development and Services Committee of the International Association of School Psychologists? Yes. 
Were you president of the International School Psychology Association? Yes. And have you served as an associate editor on a journal called School Psychology International? Yes. Are you still serving on that in that capacity? Yes. Can you tell me what it means to be an editor or an associate editor of a journal? Is oh. this a professional journal? Yes. Mm -hmm. and You're let me ask some foundational sorry. questions if I may. I'm sorry. Um, who, what is the readership of this journal? Who's it written for? It's uh, written for child educational school psychologists all over the world. And what types of materials are published in that journal? Uh, well, theoretical uh, articles, uh, giving some perspective on some issue uh, of child development, uh, articles uh, that describe uh, research that's been done, and articles that describe uh, practices that are developing. And how do articles come to be published in a journal such as this? They are sent to the uh, uh, to the journal's office, and then uh, the editors uh, th disseminate those to uh, individuals who are expected to read them carefully and uh, make evaluations and make recommendations about whether the articles should be published or not. Who are the people who read these? I mean, am I going to get these articles in the mail, or do you have to have some particular? No, no, you have to be someone who's recognized and respected f in regard to the issues that that particular journal is concerned about and that particular profession. Okay, and is that referred to as peer review? Yes. And so once these articles are submitted, then people who are recognized as experts in the field read them and see if they seem to have some merit? Yes. Is that correct? And as an associate editor, are you called upon to read and review material of that sort yourself? Y yes. Um, actually, for that particular journal, I, I have, uh, haven't had many of those, but I certainly have for an, other journals. Okay, so you're called upon to review the work of your colleagues before they're published in other yes. journals. Is that correct? Right. And in addition to reviewing the work of other people in your field, uh, do you write and publish material yourself? Yes. And do you submit uh, those articles for the type of review that you've described here? Yes. And have you uh, written a number of articles which have then been published? Yes, I have. And are they in this same field, that is, the area of child abuse and psychological maltreatment? Uh, they're in that uh, area, yes. And in fact, um, your, uh, your resume, if you will, contains a list of 48 such publications. Does that sound? Well, that sounds good? about right. Uh, they probably go across uh, child abuse, neglect, and psychological maltreatment and children's rights issues. And have you also published material which has become part of textbooks that are used? Yes. And is the treatment of fi family violence one such textbook? It's a, a book that probably be, is being used as a text in a variety of places. I'm not, it's, I don't have the information to indicate to me uh, what its usage is. And did you write material that was published in the Absact Handbook on Child Abuse and Neglect? Yes, I've, I've uh, written material for that. That handbook is still in process. And APSAC, which is all capital letters, A-P-S-A-C, what does that stand for? American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. And what is that organization? It's uh, the National Professional, it's a national association that focuses on the theory, conditions, research, practice uh, relative to child abuse and neglect. Uh, it is the association that's made up of professionals such as physicians and psychologists and social workers and so on. And you've made presentations also, haven't you, in, in uh, this field and, and uh, related fields? Yes. And I have 55 listed on the CV that you gave me. Does that sound accurate? That sounds about right to me. Okay. And Included in here are many of the, uh, of the states, but in addition, you've listed that you made presentations in Turkey, Brazil, Slovakia, Canada, England, Switzerland, and Sweden. Is that correct? And Germany. And Germany. 
have you also conducted research uh, yes. in this area? And what type of research have you conducted? Well, the, the two uh, that uh, I've been working on recently, well, actually there, there are quite several of them, uh, the research has been in the area of psychological maltreatment of children and in the, areas of, uh, in the area of children's rights. And were you given a grant by the United States Department of Health and Human Services? Yes. Uh, to do some work? Yes. And did you do some research with regard to juvenile court and family court judges? Yes. And what was that work, basically? Uh, that uh, was an attempt to uh, determine what the perspectives of juvenile and family court judges are on their experience in dealing with uh, psychological maltreatment of children. And did you also do a study of childhood experiences of juvenile offenders? Yes, that uh, was another study. Did you recently make a presentation to the Boy Scouts of America? Yes, in September. And what was that? Uh, they, the Boy Scouts had uh, a national conference on child abuse and neglect. And it was a conference in which they invited all of the, or many of the other child service organizations in the country, so Girl Scouts and the YMCA and 4-H and so on. And they, uh, the Boy Scouts asked me to uh, give two workshops on psychological uh, maltreatment of children. Now, you've referred to this, this concept of psychological maltreatment. Yes. Is that a, a, a term that has been used for a long time, or when was it developed? No. It, um, that term began to be used more and more after 1983. Before that, uh, there were a variety of terms used for this mental injury, emotional abuse, emotional neglect. So they. So psychological maltreatment, emotional maltreatment, emotional neglect encompass yes. the same area? Yeah. You know, psychological maltreatment encompasses all of the others. Uh, the importance of that term is that it recognizes uh, both those um, acts uh, which are uh, acts of commission, doing something to someone, and acts of omission, uh, withholding behavior or conditions that someone needs, and that it goes across both those things that are, have to do with the emotions or the affective states and those things that have to do with uh, cognitive states and thinking, and give some consideration certainly to motivation, which s combines certainly those two. Is there a psychological maltreatment component of sexual abuse of children? Yes. And is there a psychological maltreatment component of physical abuse of children? Yes. Is there a recognized definition of this term, psychological maltreatment? Well, there have been a, uh, many, many definitions in this area. Uh, that was one of the major problems that the field had to deal with and why Child Protective Services and uh, many of the people concerned about child abuse in this country uh, felt that not much progress was being made because there, were not, there was not a set uh, that was generally supported and agreed upon. And uh, during the last um, 10 years, uh, some genuine progress was made in that area, and now there is a set of categories and definitions that uh, enjoy uh, rather wide support and that give then those concerned with this area uh, a common, uh, the opportunity to work from a common base or a common perspective so that they, uh, when they're talking about something, they understand each other a little better. Who developed this definition? Uh, it, the, the major contribution to it uh, was the uh, research uh, that was conducted for uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and the National Center on Child Abuse and Neglect, which uh, my office um, was responsible for. And if you look over your right shoulder, you will see a yes. board which has a, a chart. Do you have the small, smaller copies with you to refer yes. to? Yes. And on that uh, exhibit, Your Honor, I'll, I don't have the number right offhand, but I'll get it later. Um, does it? Does that exhibit list? It's exhibit 295. 
295, thank you. Does that list various types of psychological maltreatment? It lists the major categories. Uh, the first six um, have uh, a good deal of uh, th theoretical expert opinion and uh, research support behind them. The, the first five, excuse me. The last one uh, was uh, derived from the others uh, so that because it's an area that's been given so much traditional consideration that it seemed important to, to pull though that out of the other categories so people would be sure that it was being covered. And are these, uh, these categories of behavior which there is some consensus that they have some negative impact on the child if they're subjected to them? Yes, that's right. Uh, these are the, the acts of, or these labels uh, present the categories that there are the actual acts of psychological maltreatment. And so they, and they are of concern because they are understood to uh, be damaging. Uh, to people who experience them. And are, is it true that a number of the acts that fall in these categories are verbal acts, that is, there are things that are said? Uh, in, a, in all cases, uh, there can be acts that are verbal that are associated with those or that are express uh, those particular areas. Uh, probably, well, I, I'll, I'll make a, an exception in a sense. The denying emotional needs, right? it's, not, it's not an exception clearly, but uh, often it uh, refers to a situation in which there are, is actually not much being said at all or much being done. You've heard the childhood expression of sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me? Yes, yes. Um, is, that, uh, is that a true statement? No. Uh, in fact, um, I, I'm trying to remember now there was a film uh, uh, that was produced recently that actually ended that phrase with, but words can hurt forever, which many people understand in their common experience and which um, many uh, uh, really uh, quite a, a good uh, percentage of those working in child abuse and neglect work understand is the case. Now, with regard to the first category, which is rejecting or degrading, is there a commonly accepted explanation or definition of that category? Well, the one that, uh, that we've produced and that we uh, keep refining through work with experts around the country uh, is that um, rejecting and degrading uh, includes verbal and nonverbal parent or caretaker acts that reject and degrade the child, meaning things like belittling, uh, hostile or rejecting treatment, shaming, ridiculing the child for normal behavior, consistently singling a child out uh, to be criticized and punished, publicly humiliating a child. Those are some of the different facets of uh, rejecting and degrading. Okay. And when you talk about terrorizing or endangering, what are you referring to there? Well, here we're talking about um, behavior, caretaker, parent, parental behavior that threatens uh, or is likely to physically hurt, kill, abandon, or place the child in The child or the, or the child's loved ones and objects in recognizably dangerous situations. And it has a number of subcategories, too, that give it uh, further definition. So does that, does it include actually being violent against the child, physically Yes, violent? it includes uh, both acts of violence that are actually carried out and those that are threatened toward the individual himself or herself or toward loved ones or objects that are of importance to that person. And is there a belief that um, scaring a child um, on a, any kind of a regular basis, even if you don't do physical harm to them, may be psychologically damaging to them? Yes.
with regard to isolating. Can you explain what that is? Yes, those are acts that consistently deny the child opportunities to meet needs for interacting with or communicating with peers or adults inside or outside the home. Can mean confining the child or placing unreasonable limitations on the child's freedom of movement in this environment, placing unreasonable limitations or restrictions on the child's social interactions within the home, or placing unreasonable limitations or restrictions on social interaction with peers or adults in the community. Is there another category called exploiting or corrupting? Yes. And could you tell us what that is? Yes. That uh, includes acts that encourage the child to develop inappropriate behaviors that would be self-destructive or antisocial or criminal or deviant. And uh, that can include then uh, modeling, permitting, or encouraging such antisocial behavior. Or modeling, permitting, or encouraging developmentally inappropriate behavior, behavior that doesn't fit the developmental characteristics of the child. <laughs> On the chart, I've used the words denying emotional needs. Uh, I believe that's not your choice of words for that category. Is that correct? Right. And what is yours? Uh, denying emotional responsiveness. Um, in, in other words, the child is not, the responses are not provided to the child. As the child expresses needs or expresses fears or concerns or emotions, tries to, in one way or another, involve somebody else in interacting with them. Uh, so when you're being detached or uninvolved, uh, either through incapacity or lack of motivation, or interacting only when absolutely necessary, or failing to express affection, caring, and love for the child would be subcategories of that area. And the last one, which is denying mental, educational, or medical needs? Yes, and that focuses uh, rather clearly, I, I think, on uh, situations in which a child is having problems or, or needs that fall into one of those areas, uh, and then that those problems or needs deserve attention, and the attention is not being given to them. Is it the, uh, the perspective or the consensus of the people in your field that all of these types of behavior do damage to children. Yes. Were you asked to make an evaluation of Lyle Menendez's life experiences as a child uh, in terms of the categories that you have listed here? I was asked to make uh, an evaluation of his life experiences uh, in regard to uh, psychological maltreatment, uh, but um, I wasn't asked specifically to use these categories. That would be my choice. When were you first contacted with regard to working on this case? January of 92, I believe. And what were you requested to do? Well, that first contact was one in which uh, you and a colleague uh, came to, uh, to talk with me uh, at a, a conference on child abuse and neglect. And you uh, asked me to, to think about uh, uh, this uh, case that you were working on and to indicate if there was uh, if it would seem to make sense uh, for me or, or for people to become involved in it in some way in dealing with uh, the child abuse and neglect issues. And what was the next step of involvement? After uh, that the, discussion? the next step in involvement, as I remember it, was that I uh, called you and said that, uh, that I thought uh, that, that this might be uh, something uh, useful to do and that I had uh, been involved in uh, developing a, a national consortium uh, to deal with the issues of psychological maltreatment, and that that group, which was concerned uh, about all of, of, of the individuals of, uh, of that group, volunteers were concerned about policy issues and standards and practices in regard to psychological maltreatment, uh, would be helped uh, by uh, coming uh, by having a chance to work uh, closely on some cases of psychological maltreatment that were uh, of concern to 
or any variety of parties, but certainly those that would be concerned to uh, lawyers and courts, which could run across uh, child custody issues, uh, child abuse and neglect issues, criminal cases, and so on. Now, how many people are there in this, uh, this group that you refer to, the consortium? Thirteen. And who selected these individuals? They were selected uh, primarily by myself and uh, a colleague, uh, two or three colleagues probably, uh, who had worked together uh, over a number of years on psychological maltreatment issues and who discussed then by telephone, face-to-face -face meetings, uh, what sort of a, what membership uh, might be helpful uh, to clarifying the uh, the issues associated with psychological maltreatment to making progress in dealing with it. And so we jointly uh, developed a list of names. And what was the criteria for that list of names? Criteria was that uh, these would be people who uh, were uh, highly respected and uh, particularly in association with child abuse and neglect issues and also in their own fields and that they were people who had been doing work in child abuse and neglect and would have uh, an interest then in, in volunteering their time to uh, work cooperatively toward uh, advancing the knowledge state and, and practices. Now, in order to have this group review this case, was a document prepared which contained a number of incidents over various developmental, pe developmental periods in Lau Menendez's life? Yes, uh, I, I requested that uh, uh, information that was available that seemed to be relevant to this area be put into a uh, organized so that uh, it was, uh, it gave attention to the different stages or phases of development. That's right. And did you submit this information to a group of these individuals to be reviewed? Yes. Did you identify who it was they were evaluating? No. Did you identify the fact that they were charged with the crime? That, no. That La Menendez is charged with here? No, they didn't know uh, the identity of the individual or the nature of the condition of concern or what part of the country it came from. <laughs> Now, when they were given this document with all of these incidents on it, were they asked to make some sort of an evaluation? Yes. With regard to that, what was that evaluation? They were asked to determine whether, uh, with the information available to them, it appeared that psychological maltreatment uh, was likely to have been a, an important, a, a major uh, contributor, significant contributor uh, to the, to the uh, experiences and development of that individual. And so the assumption was that, uh, that these incidents were true. Is that correct? If true, what would this mean for this uh, individual? Yes, we didn't know uh, whether they were true or not. We assumed that uh, uh, the information being given to us was, was probably true, but that wasn't the question. Okay. The question was, if this is true, uh, then would uh, psychological maltreatment be considered to be a significant um, part of the life of this person? And was this group asked to rate it in terms of whether it would be mild or moderate or severe psychological maltreatment? Was there any sort of evaluation of that nature? Yes. And what was the result of the evaluation of the factors submitted with regard to Lau Menendez? Uh, the, the consensus was that uh, yes, uh, if this was the background of that person, then psychological maltreatment would be expected to be a significant uh, influence on the development of that person. And how was it rated with regard to mild or moderate? As, as severe. Once the committee reached that, or the consortium reached that determination, um, did you then take further steps? Yes. Uh, within, uh, it's important to understand that there's only a subgroup of the consortium that is available to work on cases that might be going to court. And uh, what we had decided was that when there were cases presented to us uh, that uh, for which a psychological maltreatment appeared to be an important factor, 
that then we would indicate to the people who had presented that case uh, whether or not we had any people in the consortium that could be available uh, to become more um, intensely involved in that case, to be specifically involved in working on, on that case to clarify it further. And um, was there such a person identified? Yes, we, uh, I was identified okay. at that point. And did you then proceed to do the remainder of the um, intensive work on this case? Yes. And during the course of that, were you still in contact with other members of the consortium to review the work that was being done? Yes. Now, when you agreed to take the next step with regard to this case, what was asked of you? What was your task? My task was to um, evaluate uh, the experiences of Lyle Mendez, Menendez in growing up uh, to determine uh, the uh, psychological maltreatment uh, relevancy to that. Now, for the purposes of the review you've described, you operated on the assumption that the facts submitted to you were true. Is that correct? For the initial review? For the initial review, yes. When you began the second step, were you operating on the assumption that the information provided to you was true, or was that part of your goal, was to evaluate it? N no, at that point, uh, if, uh, my point of view was that uh, it, I was to start fresh and to uh, make a determination of the degree to which whatever information I found was true. And in connection with that, were you provided with school and medical records yes. to review? And to your knowledge, were you provided with all of the school records and all of the medical records that were available? To my knowledge, yes. And were you provided with a number of interviews of witnesses, interviews that were conducted both by the defense and by the prosecution? Yes, I was provided with a, a good deal of information. And did you review the school records and the medical records? Yes. And did you read the witness interviews? Yes. Were you also provided with the records of Mrs. Menendez's psychological, um, her therapy with various therapists? Yes. And did you read and consider those? Yes. And. You've already indicated that you were consulting with experts during this process, is that correct? Yes. After reading this material initially, did you make a determination that you wanted to conduct some interviews on your own? Uh, yes. Um, I was probably continuing to read the material as I made and such a, a decision. And. Did you, in fact, interview a number of witnesses on your own? Yes. Who made the determination as to who you would interview? I did. Were there any limitations <coughs> placed on what material would be made available to you? No. Were there any limitations placed on which witnesses you could interview? No. Did there were none uh, placed on me from uh, uh, the attorneys. That doesn't mean that, uh, that there weren't uh, witnesses I, I was not able to interview. Is that because they refused? Uh, well, uh, either uh, not, not really refused so much, but just simply did not uh, accept the opportunity. In connection with the um, selection of witnesses to be interviewed, what sort of factors did you consider in determining who you would talk to? Yes. Well, I had access to the uh, defendant, and I had access to uh, these reports that you've described. And I wanted to uh, have an opportunity to talk with some people directly, and I wanted to, uh, to be sure to clarify wherever I could, some perspectives. And there was some, uh, there was some information that simply wasn't 
uh, available in the reports that I thought would be useful. And so I wanted to speak to people who uh, were related to the Menendez family, who knew it as family members or extended family members uh, from both sides. I wanted to uh, speak to people who knew Lau Menendez as um, a peer, a friend. I wanted to speak uh, to people who knew something about the family uh, as uh, outside of that scope, a uh, teacher, uh, a, a work associate, and so on. Did you interview Kitty Menendez's sister, Joan Vandermolen? Yes. And how many times did you interview her? If you have uh, a face to face uh, once uh, or twice, actually, and uh, by telephone, uh, and probably twice. And how much time did you spend interviewing Joan Vandermolen, Kitty's sister? Probably about seven to eight hours across those times. And why was it important to interview Mrs. Vandermolen? Well, she knew the Menendez family, had uh, a direct acquaintance with them. She certainly knew her sister. And she knew the nature of the family in which she and her sister had grown. And was that important to you, to have information about the nature of the family in which Kitty Menendez was raised? Yes, uh, to have some sense of the kinds of conditions that might have influenced her perspective and her behavior and her choices. Why is that type of information <coughs> important? Move on to something else, please. To your knowledge, did uh, Kitty Menendez have two other siblings? Yes. Um, two brothers? Brian and Milton. And did you attempt to speak with both of them? Uh, no, I only attempted to speak with Brian. And what happened when you attempted to speak with Brian? Sustain. Did he agree to meet with you? No. Were you able to interview him? No. <coughs> Was he evasive? <coughs> Sustained. Did you also speak to Patty Anderson? Yes, I did. And what is her connection with the family? She was uh, married to Brian Anderson. And how long did you speak to Patty Anderson? Or how many times did you speak to Well, Let's that took three times uh, at least, and uh, probably four and a half to five hours. And did she know Kitty Menendez from high school? Yes. And she was married to Brian Anderson, Kitty Menendez's yes. brother? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were married for over 30 years? I'm not sure. A long time? A long time. Did you also interview Brad Warner? Yes. And what was his connection to Lyle Menendez? He had been a coach uh, for Lyle Menendez. How many times did you interview him? Uh, just once. And for how long? Two hours. Did you interview Terry and Carlos Baralt? Yes. And what is their relationship to the family? Aunt and uncle. Lyle's aunt and uncle? Lyle's aunt and uncle, uh, the sister and brother-in-law of Jose Menendez. And how many times did you interview them? Uh, once. And for how long? Five hours. And did you interview Bob Kruger? Uh, oh, uh, on that one probably was three hours for Carlos and five for Terry, because he wasn't there when we started. Uh, Bob Kruger, yes. Okay, and what was Bob Kruger's connection with Lyle? Bob Kruger was a teacher at Princeton Day School, 
when Lyle was there, and he was the father of uh, an acquaintance of Lyle. How long did you spend with him? Two hours. And did you interview his son, Cole Kruger? Yes. <coughs> uh, where does Cole Kruger live? He lives in Sweden. Uh, were you out of the country on other business and uh, yes. fit in this interview? Yes. Um, that uh, was a, uh, an interview I thought was an important one to make because he uh, knew Lyle across uh, a lot of years and uh, spent uh, a fair amount of time with him. And I was going to be out of the country, and I uh, indicated to you that I thought it would be a good idea for me to add a leg to a trip I was on anyhow. How long did you spend interviewing Cole Kruger? I spent nine hours with uh, Cole Kruger. And did you interview Roger Smith? Yes. Who is Roger Smith? Roger Smith uh, is a... Uh, it was a colleague, a, uh, a corporate colleague of uh, Jose Menendez, and uh, I believe was worked immediately uh, under him. And why did you want to speak to a colleague of Jose Menendez? Because I wanted to learn uh, something about uh, the kind of person that uh, Jose Menendez presented himself, himself as being, as he worked with uh, those who worked under him and with him. And did you read interviews of a number of other business associates of Jose Menendez as well? Yes. And how long did you spend interviewing Roger Smith? Two hours. Did you interview Eric Tam? Yes. And who is he? Eric Tam was uh, also a, an individual who was a, uh, a friend of uh, Lyle Menendez's and uh, knew him for quite a few years. And how long did you spend talking to Eric Tam? Yeah, an hour and a half total. And you interviewed him in person? No, I, I, Eric Tam I had to interview by telephone. Everyone else uh, we've talked about I interviewed in person, uh, but also in some cases added follow-up telephone okay. And did you interviews. speak to Eric Tam more than once? Yes. And did you speak to a woman named Alicia Hertz? Yes. And why did you want to speak with her? She was a teacher at uh, Princeton Day School, a, a teacher. Uh, Lyle was one of her students, and I wanted to get her impressions. She also knew the family. How long did you spend with her? One hour, by telephone. And did you interview Kitty Menendez's therapist, Lester Summerfield? Yes. And how long did you spend with him? Approximately two hours. And why did you want to speak with him? Because he had come to know her uh, in the ways that are special to a, a therapist, uh, someone that uh, you seek out to, to help you deal with the things that are troubling you and the way that you're looking at life and the problems you're facing. Did you attempt to interview Donovan Goudreau? Yes. And what happened with regard to that? I made uh, Numerous calls, probably four, five, six, something like that, and was was never given the information that I had reached him. <laughs> I reached uh, uh, people at his number, uh, but was told that uh, he was not there, and uh, there were there were, was no return uh, to me of the. Uh, of those calls, and I left the number many times. Do you know Dr. John Conti? Yes. And is he an expert who is also working on Lyle yes. Mendez's case? And to your knowledge, did he interview some witnesses personally? Yes. Uh, did he interview some of a number of the same ones you interviewed? Yes. And did he interview some others that you were not able to interview? Yes. And did you speak with him about the others that he'd been able to interview that you had not? Yes. And was Maria Menendez, Lyle's grandmother, one of those individuals? Yes. And did Dr. Conti share with you the content of his interviews with Mrs. Menendez? Yes. And were there any other 
individuals whom he had interviewed and you had not? Uh, my memory doesn't pull a particular one back, but we've talked um, several times uh, over the last few months. <coughs> now, in addition to interviewing um, all of these individuals, um, did you request that a physical examination be conducted on Lyle Menendez to see if there were any physical signs of the abuse he had, the sexual abuse he had suffered from ages six to eight. Yes, I did. I, I understood that uh, it would be uh, quite unlikely that those findings would be made, but I thought that it was something that should be investigated anyhow. And to your knowledge, was such an investigation, such an yes. examination conducted? Yes. And were the results what you expected, which was there mm -hmm. was no physical evidence? Yes. And did that indicate to you that, that, that the information was less reliable, the fact that there wasn't any sort of physical no. evidence? Why is that? Uh, because uh, it, my understanding is it isn't expected that you will find evidence uh, after such a long period of time and with someone uh, of this maturity. But it was an but area was, you wanted followed up on, is that that's correct? That's right, yes. And in addition to these interviews, reviewing the material that we've talked about, did you also read transcripts of testimony in this case? Yes. And did you watch tapes of La Menendez's testimony? Uh, yes, uh, portions of the testimony uh, I watched on tape and portions I read. Did you also consult with me? Yes. How many conversations do you think oh. you had with me? I, I didn't keep any count. I would be surprised if it was less than uh, 20 or 30. Did you make a number of trips to California? Yes. And on those trips to California, did you interview Lyle Menendez and Eric Menendez? Yes. And where did you interview them? In the jail. And how many times did you see Eric Menendez? Well, I saw him for 11 and a half hours. I must, it, so I'm one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It looks, my, my records indicate seven times. Why was it important to you to talk to Eric Menendez? Well, it was important uh, for me to get information from him about Lyle's experiences within the home and his perspectives on the family, too. But particularly to learn from him what he knew about uh, the treatment of Lyle. And you said you interviewed Lyle Menendez as well? Yes. How many times did you interview Lyle Menendez? I'm going to have to count dates uh, okay. to know that. If I counted accurately just now, uh, about 11 times. And how many hours total did you spend interviewing him? 60. All right, let's take our recess. We're at 10 minutes to the hour, and we'll resume tomorrow at uh, 9 o'clock. And would you state your name again for the record? Yes, uh, Stuart Newton Hart. All right, I'll remind you that you're still under oath. You may continue your direct examination. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Hart. Good morning. I think when we left off yesterday, <clears throat> excuse me, we were talking about the information gathering process yes. that you went through prior to making any, rendering any opinions or making any decisions with regard to this case. Yes. Is that correct? And I believe you indicated that you have read transcripts of testimony in this trial. Yes and you interviewed various family members, business associates, teachers, coaches, uh, friends of Lyle's. Yes. Is that correct? You also interviewed his brother, Eric. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And 
You spent time interviewing Lyle Menendez, is that correct? That's right. And when you interviewed Lyle Menendez, were you told what area to, uh, what areas you could talk to him about, or were there areas you weren't supposed to talk to him about, or were you free to ask him whatever you wanted? I was free to ask him whatever I wanted. Okay. And when you interviewed him, did you go by yourself, or did you have one of the lawyers with you? Or what no, I was by myself. And were there any limitations on the number of times you could see him? No. Were there any limitations on the number of times you could ask him about the same incident? No. And in gathering information from him, were you looking not only to gather facts, but to try to make some determination as to the reliability of the information you were gathering? Yes. And what process did you use to try to make sure that the information you were getting was accurate? Across all those sources, yes. Uh, well, one would be in talking to Lyle, uh, we approach topics, issues from a variety of different directions. Uh, talking, I would talk with him about uh, the kinds of things that happened to him at one stage of his life or associated with one kind of event or one activity. Uh, and then we would go to another and another, or I might come back and ask him about something that had been a particular concern to him or whether or not there were things that produced particular feelings for him or gave him particular points of view. And so, uh, in some more structured and some less structured, sometimes I would just le ask him to describe for me periods of his life, what was happening at home, what was happening at school, what happened in other activities. So within that set, what was important to me was to determine whether, when approached from that wide variety of directions, uh, did I get basically the same information over and over again? And did I get it in a way that appeared to be natural, that wasn't, uh, so that I wasn't hearing uh, statements that seemed to have been practiced? And that uh, deals with that part. Then beyond that, of course, I was interested in knowing whether those who had observed Lyle and, and his family had information that indicated that those things, things like that had happened, specific things had happened, or that uh, uh, there were conditions that would indicate that those kinds of things would be likely to happen. And in addition to that, I was interested in uh, the perspectives of people, their experiences with his parents, uh, to determine whether their behavior in other areas outside of the family would suggest that uh, some probability that they would behave in the way that I was uh, being told that they were behaving or that there would be conditions such as I had heard about within the family. And with regard to that, with regard to descriptions of their parents' behavior, yes, um, you indicated that you interviewed a business associate of Jose Menendez. Yes, that's right. And you indicated that you read a number of other uh, interviews of other business associates, yes. is that correct? that's right. And you interviewed family members. Mm -hmm. And were you given a picture of who Jose Menendez was in the public world? Yes. And just generally, what was your description of him in terms of how he operated in the public world? Objection. Who was he? Objection, improper conclusion in your side. Sustained as the form of the question. What characteristics that you felt were important did you hear about um, Jose Menendez in the public world? Objection calls for hearsay. Are you asking for what was said or his? Uh... No, his. Your Honor, I believe he's indicated that he was looking at the outside world to see if the behavior that he heard described there was consistent with the description that he was receiving from Lau Menendez of who his father was. All right, did the people wish to be heard? I'm not objecting to the questions you just postulated. Okay, why don't you just phrase it that way? Then. All right, thank you. What behavior did you, were you able to learn about in terms of Jose in the public world that was consistent with the person that Lau Menendez was describing to you? Objection calls for hearsay. I thought you said you just didn't object to that. She didn't ask the same question, Your Honor. 
I'm sorry, but... You wanted it exactly in those words? Well, yeah. Okay. Do you mind if we have the reporter read back your statement? I, I wish she would. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> outside world to see if the behavior that he heard described was consistent with the description that he was receiving from Lyle Menendez of who his father was. Okay, that's now in the form of a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that he was uh, very bright, that he was uh, uh, very effective in uh, in planning to move in directions that he wanted to go uh, to achieve goals uh, that he was a very powerful personality would dominate uh, situations that he was in that he was a risk taker who would go out to the edge uh, to achieve the things that were important to him uh, that he was cruel, that he belittled and almost di dissected people uh, in the front of other people in terms of their ideas, uh, their abilities, that he wanted to have, or that he attempted to have control of all of those factors around him and the people that worked with him and for him were expected to do exactly what he wanted to have done. And if not, they were in trouble. And was that the man Lyle Menendez described to you? Objection calls for improper opinion. Rephrase the question. Was that consistent with the behavior that Lyle Menendez described to you? Yes. And did you attempt to make the same evaluation of Kitty Menendez? Yes. And what information did you receive about Kitty Menendez from other sources that was consistent with the description you were given by Lyle Menendez? Section calls for Jason. Did you attempt <coughs> to gather information about Kitty Menendez to determine if the person Lyle Menendez was describing to you was consistent <coughs> with the other information. Did you attempt to get such information? Yes. And did you get such information? Yes. And in what ways were, were there consistent behaviors described to you? What specific behaviors were consistent? Yes. And characteristics, and I assume. And characteristics, yes. yes. Uh, that she was a, a person of, uh, who had a good deal of physical strength, who could uh, be quite uh, bubbly and uh, enjoyable to be around in some social situations. Uh, that she was a person who would put a lot of energy into things that she was doing. Uh, that she was a person who was uh, seemed uh, confused and disoriented at times, uh, often late, often not accomplishing things that she had indicated that she would, that she was a person who seemed to be unhappy, who seemed to be filled with rage, who was explosive, unpredictable in that explosiveness, and who uh, was strongly critical at times. Now, in receiving information from Lau Menendez, did he seem to be eager to tell you negative things about his family? Calls for speculation. Is the demeanor <coughs> of the person who is giving you information important to you? Yes. 
And do some people try to sell you on their view of the world? Certainly. And are certain people enthusiastic about sharing information and, and eager to give you information? Yes. Was Lyle Menendez, is it, strike that, is it important in assessing the credibility of someone or the veracity of the information uh, to evaluate the manner in which the information is delivered to you? Yes, that's one of the factors. And did you assess Lyle Menendez's demeanor? Yes. Was that part of your evaluation? Yes. And what was his demeanor with regard to providing information? Uh, in the uh, first set, the, the early periods of talking with him, uh, it appeared to be very difficult for him to talk about the kinds of things that were going on, had gone on in his home, the kinds of things that would speak negatively about his mother and his father. And uh, he would uh, put his head down, and he would have uh, yeah, struggle for words, and often use words that were uh, sort of more positive than, than he used eventually. They were words that sort of glossed over uh, characteristics. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, increasingly with an opportunity to meet and come to know each other, uh, he was able to speak more directly about those things and in a manner that uh, cleared uh, that indicated that he was he was thinking out loud as he talked about it that he wasn't giving me uh, again a, a script or something he had memorized have you had occasion to evaluate or interview people who hate their parents so I've had a chance to evaluate or, and interview people who have a, a lot of anger, a lot of negative feelings about their parents. Did you see that in Lau Menendez? No, I didn't. How much time did you spend with him? 60 hours. And did you feel that, that in that period of time you were able to get a, an accurate picture of who Lau Menendez is? Yes. And did you feel that you got an accurate picture of what his family life was like? Question of proper opinion. Rephrase question. Did you get, do you feel that you were able to form an impression of the relationship between him and his parents and his brother? Yes. But I take it you did not rely exclusively on the information that he supplied you? No, I did not. As a way of organizing this material in order to evaluate it, did you put it together by various age groups? Yes. And what were the age groups that were important to you in order to group the events of his life? Well, well the option was available to break it down into um, briefer periods, shorter range of years. I uh, put it in uh, what would be the preschool period, uh, the primary school period, and then adolescence, which really could go on into early adulthood. And when you say the preschool period, I take that that's zero to what age? Zero to five or six, yeah. Now, I take it that if something happened to Lyle Menendez when he was six months old, he wouldn't remember it. He wouldn't be able to tell you about it. Is that correct? That's correct. You, you, uh, you, you know at the outset uh, that unless there's been someone uh, in the family able to observe uh, regularly, uh, that you're not going to have as much information available at, uh, for the early years. But what it, is, there, is there any effect? If Lau Menendez were to have received either physical, psychological, or sexual maltreatment at six months or at one year or at 18 months and couldn't tell you about it today, does that mean that those events would have no effect on him? No, uh, it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, there uh, certainly is research indicating that in those early months, uh, the impact of 
the interactions with other people, the conditions around you, uh, can have an influence on your development. And is it important to know things about the attitude of the parents in addition to the acts of the parents? Yes, because it's uh, suggestive, in some cases strongly suggestive, of the way that they would behave toward or around their child. You have information, I believe, that Kitty Menendez did not want to have a child when Lau was born. Is that correct? Yes. Now, we have no information that before he was born she was telling him, I don't want to have you, or that he heard those words. So why would it be important to you to know that fact? Objection meeting. It's one of the kinds of factors that uh, indicates uh, the likelihood of, of poor care being provided for a child, lack of interest or negative feelings around a child. In fact, that's the kind of information that is used uh, in some of the risk assessment devices uh, that uh, in which they investigate perspective of the mother, uh, life conditions of the mother while she's in the hospital preparing to give birth or shortly after that allows uh, judgments to be made about whether or not services should be offered uh, to that family in the terms of, of helpers who will uh, provide uh, different perspectives, uh, information about child development, uh, information about uh, good parenting practices to those who are at risk to mistreat their children. Now, is there such a program that's actually in existence? Yes, uh, there is a program of this nature in uh, Hawaii that uh, the last time I checked on it, about two-thirds of the state applied the program and it was offered at no charge these services to those families that appeared to need help and it's provided by the state of Hawaii as I understand it. Now, you're not suggesting, I take it, that everyone who finds themselves pregnant is not happy about it turns out to be a bad mother? No. Okay. So is it not. just a factor that you look at? It's, it's one of, of many factors that would be considered. And you have information, I believe, that Kitty Menendez mm -hmm had wanted when Lyle was an infant to have him live at her mother-in-law's and visit him on the way to skiing and on the way back. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's right. Uh, now, do you have any information that Lyle remembers that or even knew about it at the time? No, uh, not in terms of knowing uh, that his mother had said something like this. Is a factor such as that important to you? Yes, it certainly uh, expresses or indicates the state of the mind of the mother about the child, about the value of the child, about the, uh, the importance of close and regular relationships of being supportive to that child. Now, would you expect that if someone had those feelings, that those feelings would come out, if not in words, certainly in behavior? Objection calls for speculation and conjecture. Is there evidence to suggest that we act on our feelings? Yes. So would it be your opinion that a mother who did not want a child and who in fact wanted someone else to raise him would be likely to demonstrate those feelings in other ways? Objection and proper opinion. Did you find other evidence of Kitty Menendez's behavior that suggested to you that she was acting out these feelings? Yes. And these feelings of rejection, uh, which you're aware of from before his birth, uh, based on the information you received, did she continue to act in a highly rejecting manner throughout Lyle's life? Yes. Is there evidence to suggest that even infants receive messages from behavior from their caregivers? Yes. And so if Kitty Menendez was acting in a rejecting manner when he was an infant, is it your opinion that that would have some effect on him? Yes. What type of effect would it have? Well. Uh the literature suggests that if you experience that kind of rejecting behavior in the uh, first year, 
and a half of life uh, that you're likely to become self-activate or self-isolating, excuse me, and uh, to have some difficulty developing coping skills. What self-isolating mean? Uh, that means that you tend not to expect or reach out for <laughs> support from other people as much and you're more likely to pull within yourself or or keep feelings and thoughts to yourself. Now, do these early experiences just fade with time? At, at some point at six or at eight or at 10 or at 20? No. They no longer have any impact on you? Uh, they might be reduced somewhat depending upon whether you experience uh, other kinds of caretaking that are significantly different than this. But the, these early months and early years of life are, continue to be considered the most critical uh, period uh, in, in determining the kinds of development that will follow. Now, when you started putting your material together to evaluate this case, I, I believe you indicated that you had grouped it by age and by category. Is that yes. correct? And did you make an effort with regard to every event <coughs> you relied on to find some corroboration? Yes. Were you always able to find corroboration? No. Were you able to find corroboration in a great number of the incidents on which you relied? Yes. In, um, you have the chart with you, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. OK, let's try and work off of that. Under terrorizing events in the preschool years, you've made reference to an incident in which Lyle was bitten in the face, bitten <coughs> on the face by a dog and that Kitty had placed him in a situation with this dog who was known to be dangerous. Is that correct? Yes. And terrorizing breaks down into terrorizing and endangering. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes? Now, with regard to that incident, um, this happened when Lyle Menendez was three years old. So you got information from this, about this from relatives, I think. Yes. And. Were you also shown, uh, Your Honor, what's next in order? 303. And I think the chart was 303. I'm sorry, 304. Okay, thank you. I'd like to mark as 304 now. Eh? Oh, in, yeah, in this particular case, there were medical records of the, right. yeah. I'd like to mark as 304, a two-page document which I've shown to the prosecution, which is a Great Western Life. Uh, insurance report, medical report. May I put you witness? Yes. Okay. Dr. Hart, showing you what we've marked is 304. Do you recognize that? Yes. And what is that? That's a, uh, well, actually, this is a, an insurance uh, claim and indicates that, uh, uh, that Lyle was bitten by a dog who became angry with him and attacked him. And what is the date of that? Uh, March 9, uh, 1971. And he was born uh, January 10, 1968, so it would have been three years old yes. at the time. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, does he also have a scar on the right side of his face from that? Yes. And uh, you said you also received information about this from <coughs> relatives. Is that correct? Yes, there were reports from relatives, as I remember. Um, so this is an incident in which you had a number of ways of corroborating it. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. In the terrorizing category in the preschool years, um, you identified eight different events which you thought uh, were either terrorizing or endangering. Is that correct? Yes. Now, do you feel that that was every terrorizing or endangering act that he experienced during that period of time? No, those are the ones that, uh, for, for which there were memories uh, for people, some kind of information uh, to indicate they had occurred. And within your list, there, are there some that are of more significance to you than others? Yes. 
So included in your list you have that Lyle was often left in the playpen crying. And you also indicate that he was punched in the stomach, in the stomach by his father for wetting his pants. Yes. Now, those are very different types of events. Is that correct? Yes, certainly. Um, one is a one-time event and very dramatic. Yes. And the other is a perhaps more minor event, but of a more chronic or repeated pattern. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, I'm leading. Is there, are there events that only happen once that are extremely significant? In this particular set. Uh, oh, yes. Overall. Yes, you, you have a combination of, uh, actually you have a variety of categories. You could have those things that only needed to happen once uh, to be of importance because they would be so str have such a strong influence. Uh, you have those events that uh, happen uh, in sort of episodically. You might have them happen at this time, then a little later on they would happen, then a little later on they would happen, but maybe with a good deal of space between. You'd have other events that, uh, that might be uh, quite, uh, or continue, they'd be quite regular. In this category you've talked about uh, Kitty's driving and Lyle not being secure in the car during a wild ride, so he's thrown around, um, him being left alone at the airport, uh, the swimming incidents, being held underwater, that type of thing. What is the message to a child of being subjected to terrifying events when they are less than five years old? No. Well, one of the uh, fundamental building blocks uh, for healthy development is to learn to trust your world and end up trusting yourself and that the world is a, play, a good place a place where you're going to be taken care of. And when these things happen, the world then is becoming a known to be a dangerous place, one in which you might be hurt at any time, one in which bad things can happen to you that you have no control over. So it becomes a scary place, just the opposite of what you would want to have happen for a young person. Why is it important for a child to trust their environment? Well, so that they will feel safe in it, so they'll feel that they can explore that environment, uh, so that they'll get a sense that the people around them are people that can, can be trusted, uh, that are not going to hurt them. You've listed um, a couple of incidents about um, isolating, one of which was that he was sent to his room, and this is again, preschool under five, sent to his room. By six o'clock at night, the door was locked and he was not let out to go to the bathroom, wasn't given any food, etc. cetera. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Now, is that information you have from Lyle Menendez or is that information you have from other sources? Uh, from uh, other sources in addition. And what is the effect on a child uh, who is less than five, who's sent to his room regularly at six o'clock and not allowed to eat and not allowed to get out and yeah. yes. go to the bathroom. Well, the magnitude of the effect will depend on a lot of other things that are happening. But again, uh, when you're a young child, uh, you want to be around people while you're awake. You, want to, you need the support of people. You need to know that uh, they want you to be around them <laughs> and not to be off uh, where you aren't able to seek help, where you aren't able to seek comfort from them. and. Uh, and so those would be the things that would go wrong. Under rejecting and degrading experiences in this age period, you've listed uh, nine separate incidents that you could document and included were uh, Kitty's abandonment of Lyle in malls, in the airport, uh, her lack of affection, <coughs> her dragging uh, Lyle down the hall by his hair, uh, the making fun of Lyle's stuttering, Kitty's complaining of the damage that the children caused to the marriage, uh, and the belittling of Lyle because of the way he walked. Yes. Now, are there particular events in that group that you consider to be more significant than others? Well, actually, all, all those are pretty significant events. What's, uh, what's the significance of Kitty not showing affection to Lyle or not tucking him in at night? Jackson assumes tax not in evidence. 
right, assuming those things occur. <coughs> yes. So are you asking it in that fashion? Yes, Your Honor. I'd like to incorporate your suggestion by reference, if I may. Assuming these events occurred, what would be the effect on a child? Of, of not having affection shown. Uh, yes. it, would, it would indicate that you're not deserving of affection, that you're not lovable, you're not something worth caring about. It's, it's, it's also a basic uh, need that children have to have that kind of nurturing, that kind of comforting, that kind of valuing. Is this something minor, hugging your child, using pet names, speaking to them affectionately, showing them that you love them in whatever your manner is? Is that important to a child at That's this important age? to a child, yes. What happens if you don't show the child this? Don't show the child that they're loved? Well, again, uh, the child will sense that it, he isn't lovable, that there's something wrong with him. <clears throat> what is the implication of making fun of a child who stutters or making fun of a child because of the way that he walks? Yes, and, and in fact, as you were mentioning, the number of items, they're actually, uh, underneath those, such as the, the, the duck walk, the criticizing of that, there are many different ways that was shown, so it's really more than an incident or, or a condition, because it was something that happened over and over in, in different ways. Well, during this period... Excuse me, when you say I'm over sorry. and over, you mean there were various forms of humiliation related to the way he walked? Yes. And were there various forms of humiliation related to the way that he spoke? Yes. And so this didn't just happen once, where somebody said, you walk like a duck. That's, that's my understanding. Uh, in addition to uh, the importance of learning that it's a world you can trust in, you're also starting to learn at this time that you can trust yourself, that you're a, a person who can do some things. And so to degrade these very basic uh, the sort of competencies that are developing, talking and walking, uh, is, is really uh, a rather a severe way to, uh, to show a child that he is flawed. Do children look to parents in particular for a picture of who they are, whether they're okay, what their strengths and weaknesses are? Yes, um, certainly uh, with particular emphasis during this period and, and in the early stages of the next period, uh, you're looking to that outside world to help you make sense out of that world. And what the most powerful people in that outside world are saying to you by actions and words, uh, directly or implied, uh, is the message that you're going to give the most weight to. That must be what it is. Does that then become your own definition of yourself? Yeah, yes, it, uh, it, it certainly would make up a good part of that. And the information with regard to Lyle's stuttering and his parents' reaction to it, I take it that the parents' reaction to it uh, came from Lyle and from other sources? The, the parents' reaction to the stuttering and the, and the walk and so on. And the existence of the speech problem itself, did you see documentation of that? Yes, I did. That it had been recognized in the school and that then finally some help was given, I think, when he was about 11. Okay, Your Honor, I'd like to mark as next in order 305. A two-page document entitled School Health Record. Dr. Hart, I'm going to show you what we've marked as 305, which appears to be school records for La Menendez. Have you seen those before? Yes. <laughs> and is there an entry which indicates that the school identified that he had a speech disorder? Uh, there's an indication, uh, private physician exam, articulation, something, speech therapy, I think it's suggested SUG. It's a little hard to, uh, to make it out. But. And what year was this from? Mm -hmm. Oh, this was uh, dated 
in uh, 76. So Lau would have been eight years old at that mm -hmm. time? Yes. And did you review the records to see uh, when, if ever, the speech problem was addressed by the parents? Yes, the, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it was addressed uh, when the therapy uh, started, which was in 79. There was an indication somewhere in the record of some speech classes going on in school, but there wasn't any clarification in regard to what that meant. And uh, the fact that it was indicated here that the therapy was suggested would uh, uh, certainly suggest that it wasn't taking care of that, if that was the time period. I've handed you now what we've marked as 306. And does that appear to be speech therapy records from 1979? Yes. And Lyle would have been 11 years old at that time, right. is that correct? Yes. So we're aware, or you have information that he had this speech disorder before he even entered kindergarten, is that correct? Yes. And the first treatment that can be documented that he had was in 1979 when he was 11. Yes. Is that correct? In the preschool period, uh, you also found incidents in the exploiting, corrupting area. And one of the items that you mentioned was uh, Lyle's witnessing of the physical violence between his mother and father. Is that correct? Yes. And is there evidence to support that witnessing physical violence is damaging? Yes. Or is it only people who suffer physical violence themselves that are damaged? No, witnessing uh, is damaging. In what way? Well, uh, it can be damaging in a number of ways. Uh, for one thing, uh, it's teaching you that it's a violent and dangerous world out there in general. In another, it's teaching you from whom that violence can come. And then when it is between the two most important people in the world, it's teaching you that uh, people who are supposed to care about each other are able and do hurt each other. Under denying emotional responsiveness, which is the same as denying emotional needs, um, you've list a number of incident, listed a number of incidents um, some of which appear in other categories, such as being left in the playpen, uh, not having an emotional response uh, to his crying, being punished for crying, not being allowed to show emotion, um, not being nurtured. Now, why is it important in this preschool era uh, of a child's life to be able to not only <coughs> receive emotion from other people, but to be able to express it? Direction, compound and leading. <coughs> Ask him if, uh, he does identify all those things. You enumerated as things that fall within that category. Are all of those items uh, items which fall within that category? Yes. As I'm remembering the items that you read off a minute ago. Okay. And is it important, you've already indicated that children need to receive affection from other people. Yes, that's well established. And is it also important for a child to be able to express emotions? Yes. Why? It, well, it's important to be able to express them, to start to deal with them, uh, to start to move toward being uh, a human being who has those emotions, the, and to have uh, appropriate reactions to those. So that when you're in need, when you're under stress, when you reach out for someone to hug you, you need to have that happen. A, uh, it's been described by a colleague of mine who's an expert in this area as uh, uh, there should be a slow dance between the infant and parent and the infant should lead. Is it, uh, is it something that, that you hear commonly, little boys shouldn't cry, little boys don't cry? Uh, is there a sort of cultural ba bias against little boys expressing emotion? Uh, yes, there's a long-standing cultural bias. It's that one that uh, we've been moving out of in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, but still some emphasis on that. Is there any evidence to support the theory that little girls have emotions and little boys don't? No. 
do they have different degrees of emotion or different types of emotion, or are they the same? Uh, th that isn't clear that there are important differences there. So what's the effect of telling a little boy you can't cry, you can't show pain, and that there's something wrong with you if you do? Right. It could have several means. It could mean that uh, the feelings that you have are of no consequence. They shouldn't be given any attention, and therefore there's something wrong with you. It may mean uh, that you are, the strong message is that you're to deny those feelings. You're somehow to cover them up, to just stop them. And what's the message to the child who has these feelings and is being told that there's something wrong with the feelings? Well, it, it could be, uh, and probably would be, a, a mixed message, which is people don't care about my feelings. They won't react to my feelings. I can't depend on them to care about them. Or there's, or there's something wrong with me even having the feelings. Do people use feelings as a guide to life? I mean, do we do some things by instinct and by emotion? Yeah, certainly feelings are an important part, the emotional side, the affective side of life, uh, to give it strength, to give it meaning, to give it joy. You, also in this category, we have the denying mental, educational, or medical needs. Yes. Is that correct? And you evaluated yes. Lau Menendez in, in those areas. Yes. Is that correct? Do you have any reason to believe that his parents didn't take him to the doctor when he had a cold or a sore throat? No. No, the, uh, the records that I reviewed indicated that uh, the visits to the doctor for things like that were uh, fairly frequent. Okay. So for this preschool period, is it uh, fair to say that, that the most, if not the only, real evidence you have of, of neglect in this area would be with regard to the speech Objection problem? Uh, yes, uh, that falls outside of that range. That was something that uh, was evidently apparent to them that they were concerned about, that they criticized for, and yet didn't seek help for. Is it your testimony that Kitty and Jose Menendez never did anything for Lyle Menendez? Never no. took care of him in any way? No. Okay. no. Did they provide him with a house to live in? Yes. Did they provide him with food? Yes. Did they provide him with clothing? Yes. Paid for schools for him? Yes. Paid for tennis lessons? Yes. Is it possible that a child who lives in a nice home, is well-dressed, goes to good schools, and receives private tennis lessons still can be suffering emotional or psychological damage in that home? Yes. Is there any reason to believe that only poor children receive psychological damage? No, and in fact, when I helped the National uh, Committee for the Prevention of Child Abuse develop their booklet on emotional abuse or psychological abuse, we made a point of presenting an incident of that type because it was certainly known to exist. In fact, if you are, are poor, um, are you more likely to have people interfering in your life? Does it call for improper opinion or speculation? Rephrase the question. Uh, do people in the lower socioeconomic groups of our society tend to have interference in their lives from social workers, perhaps more police presence, that type of official uh, visiting of the home? Objection, improper opinion, lack of foundation. Do you have an opinion in that area, in terms of the uh, isolation of a wealthy family versus well, the exposure of a family who is less economically advantaged? I know that uh, the reporting of child abuse is much more likely among those in the lower socioeconomic range, and therefore uh, it would appear that they are more subject to, uh, to monitoring or intervention on the part of society. Is another possible interpretation that rich people don't abuse their children? It's a, a possible interpretation, but uh, there's uh, not much to support its accuracy. 
in the area of the primary years, now that would be five until what age? Oh, about 11 or so. Okay. Now, are there far more events in this category than in the primary, in the preschool age? Yes, uh, this is a period when there were uh, more people who would have knowledge of conditions and in which Lyle would also uh, be more likely to remember his experiences. <coughs> and was one of the, uh, was the first category that you charted within the primary age group terrorizing? Yes. And did you chart somewhere between 25 and 30 independent acts of terrorizing? Uh, well, without counting them, I, I have two and a third pages about uh, of terrorizing items. So, it, oh wait, in fact, I think the. Looks like about 40 or, or so, and some of them with multiple uh, instances or. Now included in there, and I, I don't want to have you go through all of them, but I would like to just refer to some of them and then have you tell me which ones you think are of particular significance. Uh, did you include in there uh, the being held underwater during swimming? Yes. Uh, the confrontation between, or the incident with Lyle and his father in which he painstakingly sets up toy soldiers and his father destroys them all in a yes. very short period of time in spite of the fact Lyle's crying. Uh, <coughs> did you include the being trapped in the shower with the hot and cold water? Yes. And Lyle being dragged down the hall by the hair? Yes. And Lyle being thrown into the coffee table? Yes. Lyle being sent outside on the roof or out to the doghouse as punishment? Yes. Lyle observing his parents fighting? Yes. And this is physically fighting? Yes. Uh, Lyle being punched in the stomach for eating the wrong food while on the eat to win <coughs> diet? I believe I did. I'm just having it's trouble finding of, it. It's the right-hand column at the top of the first page. Oh, yes, there it okay. is. Okay. Do you include Lyle uh, finding his rabbit crushed to death in the trash can? Yes. Uh, did you include Lyle here having his mother scream at him, uh, pull his hands away from his ears when he's attempting to block her screaming and calling him names? I'm going down the right-hand column. Okay, page good. One. If we do it that way, it'll help. Okay. Yes, I see that one. Right. You yes, included the reaction of the parents to the bedwetting. Yes. Um, you read the testimony of uh, Jessica Goldsmith, I believe, and he told you about the incident of hanging from the balcony and being yes. punched in the stomach, um, being threatened to them threatening to send him to a school for the handicap because of his speech problem? Yes. Can call through here, sir? Sustained, yeah, um, Kitty's driving, her reckless driving? Yes. The brainwashing talks by uh, his father? Yes. Kitty smearing blood, I'm on the second page now. Kitty smearing uh, yes. blood on Lyle's face. Jose threatening to divorce Kitty and get a new family. Yes. Kitty chasing him with a knife. Yes. Um, Jose molesting Lyle. This is page two, the bottom of the first column. Oh, yes, certainly. Um, Jose saying, if you uh, don't, bad things will happen to you and you'll no longer be my son. Yes. And it goes on and on from there. Is that correct? Yes. Now. Obviously, a significant one in that age group is the sexual abuse 
of Jose Menendez? Yes. Of Lyle Menendez by his father, Jose Menendez. Is that correct? Yes. Why have you placed that in the terrorizing category? Uh, because you're you're being forced to do things uh, that uh, don't fit your development. You're being overpowered, and in this case, you're also being, as as it's indicated here, threatened with what would probably be one of the uh, uh, one of the most powerful threats uh, to Lyle Menendez, which would be that his father would not consider him to be his son anymore because his father was the most important person in the world to him. And was that only in this primary period that that was true? That he experienced that kind of message? Th that his father was the most important oh, person yeah. in the world to him? Yes. Yeah. No, it was not only in this primary period. It continued right uh, through all the periods of my uh, uh, opportunities to interview him. Now, that was years after his father was dead. Yes. And why do you say it, he continued to be the most important person in the world to Lyle? Rephrase the question, Judge Sustain. What did Lyle Menendez say to you that led you to this conclusion that his father was the most important person in the world to him? Objection here, say. Sustain. You have the conclusion that his father was the most important person in the world to him? Is that correct? Yes. And you formed that conclusion after speaking to Lyle Menendez? Yes, and others. And you believe it was your opinion that Lyle Menendez still viewed his father that way up to the last time you spoke to him? Yes. When's the last time you spoke to him? Last Saturday. And what did he say to you? Or what do you base your opinion on? Uh, objection here, sir. It's the basis for his opinion, Your Honor. All right, well. So the opinion is that he spoke with people and spoke with the defendant. Is that it? Not what was said. Well, what was said in those conversations that led you to that conclusion is what my question is. An objection here, sir. It's not being offered for the truth of the matter, merely for the basis of his opinion. An objection. Sustain. Was there anything about the way that Lyle spoke about his father that led you to believe that this is still true today? Or was as of last Saturday? Yes. What was it about the way he spoke about his father? It's uh, that he continues to talk about his father as a man who uh, had great strength, as a man who was making uh, plans uh, that would be plans that uh, could have some good things happening in his life, uh, that it was, his father uh, was someone who was just very, very bright, and who had a lot of power. You said that he was given this threat that he could no longer be Jose's son if he didn't measure up. Is that correct? Yes. If he didn't do what was expected? Yes. And was that message delivered only in the context of the molestation, or was that message delivered to him in other ways? It was uh, delivered uh, in other ways, too. What other ways? It would have been delivered uh, during the talks that they had in the basement, when they talked about uh, uh, the, uh, his tennis and what he was to achieve in that area, uh, the, the way that he was to live his life. Is there a concept called conditional love? Yes, certainly. Okay. And what is conditional love? It basically means that my love for you is dependent upon whether or not you meet certain standards, you behave in a particular way, you reach certain goals. I don't love you just because you're you. I love you if you do certain things that I want you to do. Do you have an opinion as to whether Jose's love for his son was conditional or unconditional? Objection and proper thing like a foundation. Sustain. What is the message to the child who receives conditional love? Uh, the message would be that there isn't something about me that in and of itself is lovable, that's worth caring about, but that I must do, if I care about this love, I must do what this person wants me to do. And it's what I'm able to do that's important, 
not who I am. So does this child grow up with the idea that now I've accomplished a certain goal and now I have the love, I don't have to perform anymore? Well, it would be unlikely that that kind of conditional love would be set on the basis of one achievement. So it would probably be a, an, a case in which you would be continually trying to reach another goal, trying to reach another standard, trying to reach a goal in another area to see that you could deserve that love. If a child views the love of his parent as conditional, is he secure in the knowledge that he will always be loved, or does he fear losing the love? Well, he would fear losing the love because it would be required that he keep reaching standards. You can't, you can't rest on your oars and be yourself. So if a child has this perception of his parents' love, and feels that he is displeasing the parent, does he then feel that the parent will cease to love him? Yes. And can that happen to uh, a child who is uh, older, an adolescent, a young adult? Can those same uh, dynamics still be in place? Certainly that could happen. Uh, it would not be nearly so powerful if it began at that point. Uh, because you would have had other experiences to rest on and you may have learned to value yourself in ways that aren't totally dependent on that. But if that's been a major theme throughout your life, uh, then it's going to be, uh, continue to be a very powerful element, a very powerful influence on you. You talked about, um, or you listed in, in uh, this list of events, the programming, the basement talks. Do you recall that? Yes. What is the significance of the talks that Jose Menendez had with his son, Lyle? Uh, the significance of those talks, uh, as they have been described to me, the information available to me uh, uh, about the nature of them and the fact that they continued uh, throughout his life, as we know it, uh, would indicate that he was being programmed to think and feel and behave in exactly the way that his father wanted him to. That his father was not interested in what his natural inclinations or feelings might be, but he was interested in seeing that Lyle became this person that he wanted him to be. You've been working in the field of psychological maltreatment for a number of years now, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yes. Are sessions such as, as have been described by both Lyle Menendez and other witnesses something you commonly see in families? No. Is it extremely unusual? Objection proper opinion. Overall. My knowledge base would indicate it's unusual in terms of the, the frequency and the, the detail of the aspects of his life that were being dealt with. All of us in good parents instruct their children, spend time with them, sit down. They should be mediators of the, of the child's experience, help them to think about it and figure out how to handle it. Uh, that's one of the best things you can do as a parent. But this doesn't appear to have been that kind of instructive, growth-producing, strength-producing experience. This was putting the thoughts, the behaviors desired, the feelings desired by Jose Menendez into his son. Is one of the goals of healthy child development for the child to become an independent person? Yes, certainly. Uh, the experts uh, indicate that that is a, a proper goal of human development. Most good parents want their children to become increasingly independent, to be able to make their own decisions, to stand on their own feet, to be responsible and not dependent and not controlled by others. Did you see patterns in the Menendez family which encouraged Lau Menendez to become independent, stand on his own two feet, and make his own decisions? No. Did you see just the contrary? Yes. What happens to a child who is not allowed 
to make decisions, have their own thoughts? Yeah. Well, they are very dependent on others. They don't trust their own ideas. They are likely uh, to act impulsively when faced with a problem to solve and so on because they don't trust their ability to think things through. They're used to having other people either tell them what to do or criticize them for having done something that wasn't what the other pe person wanted them to do. So it, it greatly weakens this or reduces this movement toward being an independent person capable of handling his own affairs. Were there specific messages about trust in this family and whether you should trust and who you should trust? Yes. What were those messages? Well, the, the messages were uh, numerous and of different types. Uh, some were spoken uh, directly uh, to Lyle, communicated to him, uh, as he's told it to me, that other people are, are weak, that other people can d drag you down, and that you really shouldn't connect, you should not get very close to other people. Another message uh, that was communicated to him uh, was that it's a dangerous world and that those close to you are dangerous in terms of the treatment he received from his father and from his mother, the explosiveness, the criticism, the, uh, the many things that she did uh, to him. There was another kind of message too, which was a, a direct teaching of that you should not trust anyone in the, in the most explicit terms. And this occurred when Lyle would be placed in some sort of jeopardy or in some sort of danger uh, some sort of situation in which he was physically uh, being hurt or afraid of being hurt, and his father uh, either carried out the act that put him in that condition and then told him that he shouldn't have even trusted him, you don't trust anyone and don't trust your own father, or finding him in that condition and leaving him in that condition, uh, the message was, and again, there's nobody out there to help you, don't trust anyone. Um, there's been uh, testimony about the fact that Lyle was wetting his bed. Yes. Until his teenage years, is that correct? Yes. Now, is that a normal condition for children? No. And is there any significance to you to the fact that that condition existed? Well, there are, there are several bits of significance that might be related to it. It isn't clear what the causes were. They could have been physical causes that might have been taken care of uh, naturally or, or through, by uh, pursuing uh, help, by getting professional help. That's one thing. That uh, was not pursued. There's no evidence, at least, has been made available to me that any professional help was sought for that, and this went on until 12 or 13 years of age. Uh, the other uh, possibility is that it was due or in somehow uh, its likelihood to occur frequently uh, was associated with the stress that he was experiencing. But that we can only speculate about the original cause for this. So one would be that there's a physiological problem and one is that it's stress related. Yes. And the other thing that's significant about it is that he was criticized for this thing that may have been beyond his control and that he can be quite <coughs> embarrassing. Would any child want to be wetting their bed that late in life? I can't conceive of the circumstance under which a child would want to, truly want to be wetting his bed. You talked about um, one possible explanation, one of the two explanations being that it is stress-related. Is that correct? It's one possible explanation. Your Honor, I have a document I'd like to mark as next in order, 307. 307. Council has copies of all of these documents. These are uh, pediatric reports from Dr. Katz.
Yes. Dr. Hart, among the medical records that you reviewed were the records from the pediatric group in Princeton, New Jersey, Dr. Katz being, and Dr. Levin being the primary treating physicians? I believe so. Okay. I'll show you what's been marked as 307. Do you see the results of a of an examination of Lyle Menendez in August of 1978 when he would have been 10 years old? Yes, I do. And is there a recommendation there with regard to his speech problems? Uh, yes, speech uh, therapy is noted there. And is there anything to indicate to you that there might be stress in Lyle Menendez's life in 1978? Uh, the fact that he was noted to grind his teeth What's the significance of that? It would be a nervous um, sort of behavior to deal with uh, discomfort, tension. Is, that, is, is teeth grinding a stress reaction? It certainly can be a stress reaction. And you're also, uh, you are, have you also had an opportunity to observe a scar by Lyle Menendez's Eyebrow. Yes. And were you given information about how he sustained that injury? Uh, that one was sustained, as I recall, from the uh, the coffee table incident, in which uh, Jose exploded while they were horsing around and knocked him into or threw him into the coffee table. That uh, situation, as uh, Lyle remembers it, was one in which uh, uh, he was sort of extending what uh, were the, the sexual behaviors that had been going on between his father and himself and had uh, grabbed his genitals. Can I move to strike the last portion of the answer as a conclusion on part of the witness? Dr. Lyle extending. Overall. Natural step. And were you shown um, medical records documenting the uh, treatment for that eye injury? I believe I was. I'll look for it's, them at the break uh, rather than stop here. We'll go back. All right. Well, let's take a recess. Um, make it a 10 minute recess. We'll resume at. Uh, now the defendant back in court with uh, his lawyers, the people represented, and the jury is in the jury box. Before we resume, let me just uh, say something, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as I indicated to you last week uh, when another witness was on the witness stand, I'll be giving you all the instructions at the end of the trial that will deal with all the legal issues in the case. But just in the interim here, during the course of the trial, in regards to witnesses who testify as expert witnesses, let me just give you a little additional information. A witness who testifies as an expert may rely upon evidence received at the trial as well as um, other information that has uh, been made available to him that has not been introduced at the trial. Now, during the course of the trial, you've sat here and listened to witnesses and watched the witnesses testify and describe various events. And the witness has, uh, as he said, uh, been ex been provided with transcripts of uh, that testimony, and he's reviewed that. Uh, you, since you have seen that evidence, it, it's in its form and is presented in the courtroom. You are to evaluate that evidence and decide how to treat it, whether to accept or reject it, or uh, believe or disbelieve it, or however you uh, evaluate it. And I'll give you certain guidelines to deal with that at the end of the trial. Uh, to the extent that the witness testifies about those events about which you've seen here described in the courtroom by other witnesses, um, you are the judge as to whether those events occurred. Uh, to the extent that the witness uh, describes other events that have not been testified about during the course of the trial, he assumes that those events have occurred and uses uh, that assumption to assist him as a basis to form certain opinions about uh, the matter that uh, he has, uh, has or will express. 
And uh, the fact that um, a witness assumes that certain facts have occurred does not mean those facts have occurred. It's for you to decide what has or has not occurred, to decide what events have or have not occurred, and to give whatever weight you think is appropriate to those events. And at this point, the description of these events by this or any other witness is only to assist you in evaluating the opinions of the witness as to his opinions that he expresses. All right, you may proceed. Dr. Hart, uh, before the break we were talking about, uh, or you were talking about an incident in which uh, Lyle was thrown into the coffee table by his father. Yes. Is that correct? May I approach, Your Honor? You may. I have a document, a uh, four-page document that shows the prosecution is the medical records. Dr. Hart, you have access to the medical records from July of 1974 and September of 1974. Have you seen these records before? Yes. And did you read the testimony of Alan Anderson with regard to throwing a rock at Lyle Menendez and it hitting him in the eye side of the face? Yes. And his parents, Lyle's parents' reaction to that incident? Yes. And does that incident appear to match the entry of July 24, 1974 on these records? Yes. And the September 26, 1974 entry... <laughs> Um, indicates an, a laceration <coughs> to the eyebrow. Is that yes. correct? Requiring stitches? Mm-hmm. Yes, it does. Pardon me, may we mark these records, please? Haven't they already been marked? I thought I just did. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, they were marked just before our recess. 307? Yes. Okay. Actually, I think that I have them marked as 308. Uh, well, we have pediatric I'm records as 307. I'm sorry, Your Honor. These are additional records. I'd like to mark these as 308. They're separate okay. records. Okay. All right. Have you marked them then? You put a mark on them so we know what they are? I did. Okay. All right. I did it during the break. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Hart, during um, the uh, primary <coughs> period in Lyle's life, you have a number of incidents on what is page two, I believe, of your chart, which reflect on the behavior of Kitty Menendez. Is that correct? Yes. And there is reference being made to Kitty smearing blood on Lyle's face, chasing him with a knife, uh, twisting his arms, <clears throat> using physical force on him in other ways. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, it is. What is the significance of that type of behavior? Well, uh, certainly all of those can uh, be quite scary, frightening, terrorizing in that sense. And the, the, uh, the message is uh, that this is somebody who uh, can hurt me and who at times wants to hurt me and who is very dangerous. Is there any significance to the fact that this behavior is being inflicted by your mother as opposed to someone else? Well, in the sense that, again, here is somebody who is such an important part of your life, somebody that's supposed to love you and protect you and instead is trying to harm you. And part of that harm is also bl uh, blaming uh, the smearing of the blood on the face. Uh, while that would be terrorizing to many children, uh, it's also being done, as, as described, uh, bec because Lyle is being blamed for an accident his mother had. Is there a pattern of Kitty Menendez blaming Lyle for the condition of her life? Yes. That's a strong pattern that seems to go throughout his life. And, and what, is, what is the nature of that blaming? What is the criticism that he hears? Or the response well, uh, there are many uh, criticisms that he hears, he apparently heard, uh, but uh, one theme that's repeated over and over again is that you're the cause of my misery. You're the cause of me not having the good life I could have. You're the problem in my marriage. You are, uh, you're the, the reason that I'm not happy. Did you find evidence in evaluating Lau Menendez's life that Kitty Menendez had a resentment 
uh, toward Lyle because of the amount of attention that he received from his father? Yes, that seemed to come up repeatedly. And did she seem to act out that resentment on a regular basis? Yes. Calls for speculation from other witnesses. Overall, the answer is there. And in talking to Lyle Menendez about it, did he seem to feel somehow that he was responsible for her life? Everything calls for hearsay. Overall. Uh, yes, uh, he seemed to feel that he was, but he was bewildered by it. He, he just couldn't understand it, uh, wh what he had done, why he would be getting this kind of feeling. And he wanted to love his mother, and it was just hard to understand. Uh, he wanted to think that she loved him. Hard to understand why she would be doing this to him. And is that a pattern that continued throughout his life? Yes. And, in fact, when... His brother, in 1986, reads a suicide note to him that his mother has written. Does Lyle make some effort to help his mother? Yes. And what is that? He t indicates to his mother that, uh, that he wants her to come and live with him and to leave his father uh, and that he will take care of her. And what does this represent in terms of Lyle Menendez and what will happen to his relationship with his father. Well, it, it certainly creates the possibility of uh, a, just a tremendous sacrifice for Lyle to make if his mother were to accept it. Uh, because again, his father is at the very center of his life, throughout his life. Is there a pattern that you were able to discern with regard to Lyle Menendez and his need to or willingness to protect others. Protection of proper opinion. Why don't you rephrase the question? Did you find evidence of a pattern of behavior with regard to Lyle Menendez and protecting other people? Yes. And did you find it particularly yeah. with regard to his brother? Yes. And is this just in one age range or throughout his life? Uh, th th the information I have would make it uh, s stronger in the primary and the adolescent. Rather levels. than the preschool. Yes. There was testimony about Jose using a belt uh, yes. in disciplining both boys, that he would beat both of the boys with the belt. Are you familiar yes. with that? I've noticed that you have indicated on your chart that a form of terrorization was leaving the belt around. Yes. What did you mean by that? Well, if you have been beaten with a belt previously, uh, and the belt, uh, the belt then comes to symbolize what might happen to you. Just seeing the belt, seeing it placed in a particular way, if that has been done before, preceding a time when you or someone else was going to be beaten with it, then you would be frightened, you would be anxious uh, by just that presence of the belt in that state. The majority of the examples of physical violence by Jose on Lyle Menendez are in his earlier years. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Is there an incident that occurs in his mid-teenage years, when he's around 15 or 16? Yes. And, and what is that incident? Uh, that's an incident in which, uh, for one of the very few times in his life, uh, Lyle has stood up to his father and indicated he, he didn't like what he was doing. This was in uh, practicing tennis. And uh, his father first, as I recall, hit a ball at him and hit him in the face and then grabbed him and took him off to the limousine and then struck him in the face. Uh, just very, very quickly that all, of the, that all of that appeared to have occurred. And you interviewed the coach connected with this incident yes. personally, is that correct? And the message in connection with that incident was something to the effect of, if you embarrass me again, if you ever embarrass me again, I'll kill you. Is yes, that that's right. There, there was, uh, that message uh, was stated to Lyle directly, as he's told me. Uh, but there was another message there, too, uh, which was that just as was the case when you were a young child, it continues to be the case that if you do something that embarrasses me, that there is going to be an immediate action and you're going to be hurt. Now, 
if the majority of the physical violence occurs in the earlier years, say under 12, and there is this one incident in the mid-teenage years, <coughs> Does that mean that by the time he's 20 or 21, there is no effect left of this physical violence, or does it still continue to have an effect? No, this, uh, again, these very early years, of the formative years, are so important in terms of the way you look at life, your expectations of life, how you're going to be handled. And uh, it would simply build across those years. And in a sense, uh, the punch that he received in that limousine uh, was uh, to uh, reaffirm the fact that these boundaries, this power that you learned early uh, to be afraid of and uh, to then guard your behavior very carefully around continues. Did Lyle continue to receive messages regarding the power of his father? Yes. And did he receive them directly from his father in terms of how he acted in the home? How the father acted in the home? Yes. Well, the father certainly continued to be the, the power in the home throughout all these years. The one to whom uh, people were to go uh, to get their instructions. The one who was going to uh, exert power if somebody did something wrong. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, Kitty was c capable of doing this too. And did Jose demonstrate his fearlessness um, by demonstrating his tolerance for pain. Yes, that's been described to me. Is there also a message to a child when he watches his parent interact with those outside the home? Yes. And what was the message to Lyle when he observed how his father interacted with relatives? Well, that this is a person of, of great power, a person that is, is one uh, whose attitudes and behaviors have to be considered. Was there anything about that interaction that would lead him to believe that there were relatives who were stronger, more powerful than his father? I've not come across any information uh, to suggest that, uh, that Lyle observed conditions that would indicate, have indicated to him there was somebody more powerful than his father. Anywhere? Anywhere. And does that include his father's description of his interaction at work, when his father would tell him about things he did at work? Uh, it would include that, uh, yes. And would it include his observations of his father interacting with people during the time that he worked with his father? Yes. Is it important, are, are there messages that are conveyed to a child in terms of observing interaction of the parent with other people, not only in the area of powerfulness. Do they get a lot of messages from watching that? Yes, they do. Uh, one of the uh, quite influential, quite powerful ways of learning is by watching other people. And you're likely to learn the most or one way or another uh, have, have what's happening registered if those people are important in your life and if they seem to be people who are powerful in life. What was the message that Lao Menendez received by watching how his father treated his brother Eric? Well, he learned, I believe, that his father, again and again, was someone who could punish and criticize and demean other people. And he learned that, again and again, that his father was likely to direct that at someone who didn't please him, at someone who didn't meet his standards. And that would additionally mean to him that if he didn't meet those standards, this could happen to him. Was Lyle treated with more respect in that family in terms of being viewed as the heir apparent? Or at least by Jose? Y yes, uh, he was treated with more respect uh, but that didn't keep him from being treated with uh, experiencing a great deal of criticism. But yes, he was the one that appeared to have been selected by Jose to live out the life that Jose wanted. And was Eric in a similar position? Uh, no, not from the information that I have. And so is there a message to Lyle in terms of seeing uh, 
what happens if you're not good enough? Yes, that you're uh, even that you are degraded regularly, that you are somebody that doesn't deserve very much attention, very much consideration. Was the Menendez history, the, the Menendez myth of superiority important in this family? Yes, that's my understanding. And was this a subject of a lot of the instructional material that Lyle received was that somehow he was special because he was a Menendez? Yes, as has been told to me, uh, that that was stated over and over again. And if you didn't measure up, if you weren't good enough to be a Menendez, did you have any worth at all? It's, it's hard to find instances in which uh, Jose Menendez uh, respected people other than himself. And uh, he appeared to be so attached to this notion of the Menendez superiority that those almost blend together. And if you aren't up to those standards, then you're either a second class Menendez or you're outside of the pool of those who are important and valuable. You're aware, I believe, from the uh, testimony that the children were told that they were to not reveal things about themselves or about their family to others. Is that correct? Yes. And is that a common form of behavior that you find in abusive houses or homes, that yep. they're secretive? Yes, that's a well-established characteristic of abusive homes or families. So what's the significance to you of finding that that not only Lyle and Eric, but also cousins who would stay in the house would be instructed to not reveal or actively lie about facts about their lives. Yeah. Well, it would add credibility to the idea that abuse was going on in this family and that it was a very secretive family. And uh, also to the, uh, to the notion associated with that, that the family did not want uh, to be, have any information about them revealed outside of the home that would in any way embarrass them or suggest that they were not of this superior status uh, that they wanted to enjoy. Was image important in this family? Yes, very important. What was the reaction or what was the impact of Lyle asking for help with regard to his father's molestation from both his mother and his cousin Diane and having neither of those experiences offer him any help? Yeah. Well, there'd, there'd be several meanings to that. One, uh, certainly at the very point of his purpose would be that uh, no one's ready to help you. That uh, e either people are just not going to believe you or they're not going to invest themselves in any way uh, in helping you or they're not going to confront uh, Jose with this possibility. And that it, additionally that your feelings and your needs uh, don't count. You're aware that there is uh, testimony that pornographic films were shown in the home and in fact shown to the children, is that correct? Yes. And what is the source of your information with regard to that? Uh, well, uh, the discussion with Lyle and then the discussion with uh, Alicia Hertz, who lived in the neighborhood, taught at the school, and who told me she considered the, the film that was being shown at uh, some sort of social gathering to be quite uh, inappropriate. Inappropriate for her or inappropriate for children? Well, inappropriate for many adults and uh, certainly inappropriate for children. And did she have information that it was shown to children? Objection calls for hearsay. Sustained. Objection sustained. What is the effect of showing pornographic films, sexually explicit and violent films, and I'm not just talking about Westerns type of violent, but sexually violent films to young children? Well, a again, it indicates that this is a dangerous world and that people do some terrible things to each other and that they use each other, they exploit each other for their pleasure, for whatever their desires are. And it uh, would also, depending on the 
period of development when it occurs uh, could be quite disturbing in regard to uh, what the, the meaning of sexual identity and sexual development and sexual relations are. Does it create a family in which the normal boundaries don't exist or does it yes. add corroboration to the yeah. idea that this is such a family? Uh, yes, yes, it would uh, support corroboration for that uh, because this is the kind of thing that if adults did view it themselves, uh, you would expect them to make the good judgment of, of knowing that it's not something that should be informed, shown to the children. And so what they were doing was putting the children in the spot of having to deal with things as though they had the wisdom and experience and values of, of an adult to compare that to and to come away with some good judgments. You included in your list of psychological maltreatment or psychologically maltreating events um, another form of ex exploitation, which was Jose's molestation of Lyle. Yes. Is that correct? And you also included Kitty's seductive behavior mm -hmm. and inappropriate interaction with Lyle. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's right. And what would be the significance? Well, are both of those events the same in terms of the impact on the child? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, they both can have quite negative uh, consequences. Uh, it'd be bad for the child. Uh, for the father, we're talking about uh, the confusion that's associated with a male, male, male sexual relationships and the manipulation that's associated with making that uh, acceptable uh, uh, by uh, offering the opportunity for intimacy that doesn't exist, the physical closeness. Uh, and w with, the, uh, with the mother, of course, it is out of the range of what you expect a mother to do. But in this case, again, it's a, a mother with whom he had very little opportunity for any closeness. And so would have, it would be something that uh, a, a young boy might be enticed toward, but would certainly confuse him in regard to what a mother's about, what the relationships between a mother and a boy are supposed to be, and it probably would be further confused in this case because outside of that kind of intimate relationship with his mother, as I understand it, uh, the criticisms, the, the negative uh, feelings about him, which his mother expressed, continued. Why would a young boy, six to eight years of age, get permit this to go on with his father, the sexual molestation by Jose. Why would he let it happen? He could let it happen or it could happen because he has been educated or programmed to believe that this is the proper kind of behavior, that this shows closeness, that this is the way that you, you show caring, that this is the way people have done, or this is the kinds of things people have done historically. And uh, does it, that is all right. You, does a six-year-old consent to a relationship like this? Does he have a choice? No, you wouldn't consider a six-year-old to be able to give consent that would have any the meaning that we generally apply to that because a six-year-old couldn't give consent free of coercion or <coughs> manipulation. Again, this was the most powerful figure in his life. And what this person told him was what you were to believe. And what this person asked you to do is what you were supposed to do. Plus, it offered the opportunity for closeness. Now, what about with his mother? This is at a slightly older age. Yes. Is this a, a consensual relationship when he's now 12 or 13? Um, and his mother is exposing herself or acting seductively or making herself available for sexual contact. No, it uh, wouldn't be consensual at that age either, especially for someone uh, who had been denied uh, the closeness and warmth of, of his mother. And it also uh, been uh, placed in, in situations in which it had sort of been encouraged progressively. Yeah, no, this would be a good place if we could break here, or do you want to go further? I can start another section if oh, you want to go further. I think we should go a little further here. Okay. You included uh, in your list of uh, exploiting or corrupting behavior the fact that the parents were doing schoolwork for the children. Is that correct? 
Yes. Uh, which which page are we I'm on? I'm on now? page five. Okay. Um, what is uh, isn't that every child's dream to have their parents doing their homework? Isn't that a nice thing for them to do? It's many. Ch it's the dream of many child to uh, ch children to have somebody do their work for them, um, short term at least, until they find that then they're even less they're less capable of doing uh, the next bit of work, and that they continue to be confronted with situations in which they're expected to be able to do something. But, but uh, what it does is it means that you, that you, by having your parents do that work for you, there, there are several messages. One that uh, possibly they, they suggest that you're not capable of doing it. Another is uh, that schoolwork is not important and you should be spending your time on something else. This is probably one of the messages that was pretty strongly put. And that actual learning and achievement in school is not so important as getting through it with grades. And, uh, the one of the long-term negative effects would be that you don't develop uh, the study habits. You don't develop uh, the competencies uh, that deal with the knowledge base or the skills that may be demanded. Hey, At least not to the level that you're capable of. You indicated you interviewed personally Alicia Hurst. You also read testimony of uh, the other teachers who yes. came in here testified and, and read additional interviews with other teachers as well. Is yes. that correct? Was there a pattern among these teachers of being aware of the fact that the parents were doing the homework? Yes, that uh, pattern appeared to be uh, well known. And was there any pattern with regard to how the teachers dealt with this information? The, well, the pattern wasn't so clear there. It, 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 the clearest part of it was that they avoided confronting the uh, Menendez's with this condition. Uh, there may have been teachers who graded Lyle uh, somewhat differently, taking that into consideration because they weren't confident that it was Lyle's work. And what was the explanation for not dealing with the parents? Or yeah, dealing with... Yeah, she calls for her saying irrelevant. Sustained. What was the message to Lyle, knowing that his teachers were not going to interfere in this area. Can I have a question right back, please? Question, what was the message to Lyle knowing that his teachers were not going to interfere in this area? Sustain. Are you aware of the testimony by various teachers who came in here and said that they would not interfere in this area because they were afraid of the parents. Yes. Uh, do most children view their teachers as powerful figures? Yes. And what is the message to a child that these teachers would not face his parents? Objection as soon as facts not in evidence. Overall. Well, the message was that these teachers were not going to confront his parents, that they were too powerful and too intimidating. And did this apply to both Kitty and Jose? Apparently. There was a lot of testimony about the condition of the home, the fact that it was messy, it was disorganized, the ferrets ran around, used the entire house evidently as their bathroom. Um, is there any significance to a, I'm not talking about things out of place, but a dirty home? Well, there are a number of things that could be significant about that. One uh, would be that the person taking care of the home isn't capable of, of doing those things, or that it isn't important, or that the providing a clean and environment, an attractive environment inside the home, or at least in certain parts of the home, is not an important thing. Are there laws in most states, to your knowledge, which remove a child from a home based purely on the physical condition of the home, if it is dirty enough? If, it's, if the conditions are extreme enough, I, I believe there are such laws. And is that because it is an unhealthy place for a child to be? Yes, it would be a place in which uh, you would expect the child uh, to develop illnesses. 
there has been testimony about Lyle's involvement with his stuffed animals. Is yes. that correct? And did you discuss that with him? Yes. And were you also aware that these stuffed animals sometimes became the target for the actions of either the parents or even his brother on some occasions? Yes. What is the significance of their maltreatment of these inanimate objects? Well, those uh, inanimate objects, those stuffed animals, uh, were very, very important to Lyle. This was a uh, place where he could have some control in what he pretended they were doing. Uh, he had strong positive feelings for many of them, and he could create a, a world with them, as many children would, but a world uh, that was somewhat more reasonable uh, than the one that he lived in. Uh, to uh, harm those animals uh, would be another way, or one way, to hurt Lyle, to punish Lyle to get him to feel some pain or some anguish. And since they were known to be so important to him, it's, you would assume that that kind of action was meant to somehow punish him. And did Kitty, in fact, make comments about the fact that he loved his animals more than he loved her? That's my understanding. Did she seem to express jealousy of his stuffed animals? Yes. Now, you indicated she expressed jealousy of his relationship with his father. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And did that go on through his teenage years? That's my understanding. And in fact, are there indications in uh, the records of her therapist that she continued to have the same resentment when he would come home, that she wouldn't have the same relationship with her husband? Did yes. Did you here say from the records? Sustain the answer, stricken. Did you, do you have an opinion as to whether this jealousy of Lyle with regard to his relationship with his father continued up until uh, the time of the parents' death? Yes, it appeared to continue. And you've indicated that you have evidence that she had this jealous uh, reaction to the attention that he gave to his stuffed animals. Yes. Did she also appear to exhibit a jealous reaction with regard to his <coughs> relationships with his girlfriends? Well, she certainly was known to express a lot of anger, a lot of criticism directed at his girlfriends. What was the impact of Kitty's alcohol and later on drug dependency? Objection. I mischaracterizes the evidence. Why don't you rephrase the question? Are you aware that Kitty drank regularly throughout her life? Throughout her adult life as a married woman, yes. Yes. That. And did her drinking appear to be situational? That is, it appeared to be tied to particular activities? It appeared to be tied uh, particularly to conditions when she was uh, feeling she wasn't getting enough attention uh, from Jose uh, may have gone well beyond that. Move to strike may have gone well beyond that is speculation on the Sustain. Process. Sustain that portion of the answer is stricken. Do you have information that the drinking was an ongoing problem throughout her adult life? Yes. And are you aware of the fact that she was on significant dosages of <coughs> antidepressant medication for the last several years of her life. Objection mischaracterizes the evidence and assumes facts not in evidence. Rephrase the question. Were you shown medication records for Kitty Menendez for the last several years of her life with the exception of perhaps the last six months? Yes. Which indicated she was taking substantial dosages of antidepressant medication? Yes. What is your opinion with regard to the impact that this alcohol and drug usage would have had on Lyle Menendez's life? Well, he would have seen a mother that was less and less capable of dealing with life, that seemed to be out of phase. Okay. And what is the effect of living with a mother such as she was described as being, who was subject to rages, um, violent mood swings, erratic behavior. 
What is it like for a child to live in that type of a home? Well, it would be uh, quite frightening. This, uh, these are ex explosions of, 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 of rage, of anger, of criticism uh, that could occur at almost any time. And it, we're not, uh, again, in any predictable way, uh, or uh, on occasion, we're not tied to events going on around Kitty Menendez. It, they seem to blow up, uh, to bubble up within her. And uh, so it would be qu quite a frightening uh, set of conditions. Does it give a child the idea that the world is a safe place to be? No. Did her rages seem to have a physical component to them frequently? In terms of? Yeah, in what sense? Striking out or oh, grabbing yes. by the hair or? Mm -hmm. Flailing about, yes. Yes. Do you have information with regard to the both parents continuing to be involved in monitoring Lyle's life as he becomes a teenager and even young adult? Yes. And what information are you referring to? I'm referring particularly to the uh, to the frequent telephone calls to the. Uh, flights to check on, uh, to, uh, to actually go into the area where Lyle happened to be, to check on him. Uh, and, but in addition to that, to the continuing pattern of having, having Lyle check in also when he had a concern or a problem to determine how he should handle that. And do you have information with regard to them tapping his brother's phone? Yes. And monitoring the calls between Eric and his friends, as well as Eric and Lyle? Yes. What is the effect on an adolescent or young adult to have this type of monitoring continue, this type of interference in his life? Well, it says, uh, again, that, you're, that you have to be taken care of, that you have to be watched, that you don't have sufficient competence uh, to handle your own affairs that in fact you may do things that would be somehow uh, damaging or uh, of great concern to us and so we need to watch you closely and uh, to uh, that these are, are people who will go to great lengths to make sure they know what you're doing. And in the 60 hours that you spent with Lyle did he express resentment that his parents were making the decisions for him in his life and controlling him to the degree that they were? Uh, he indicated that, that there were instances in which he wanted to do things differently than his parents wanted them, and, and on some occasions did. But uh, he was uh, really quite ac accepting of the uh, direction that his father gave to his life and to working things through with his father in the direction of the plans that his father had for him. Did he seem to go along with these plans because they agreed with what he wanted in life or was it just merely an acceptance that his father knew best or his father was going to be the one to make the decisions? Correction of proper opinion. Sustain. Did he express a participation in the making of the decisions? Uh, no, he didn't describe a participation that was a genuine participation, having his thoughts, his plans given genuine weight, but he did describe situations in which he would broach a subject, bring a subject up with his father, and uh, then if his father decided that, uh, in fact, there was, uh, that that wasn't to be given any weight, that he was just to continue in the direction that he wanted, uh, then Lyle accepted that. And was there such a discussion, to your knowledge, with regard to where he was going to school? Yes. And what are you referring to? <laughs> I'm referring to the fact that, uh, as Lyle told me, that he had uh, come to, to recognize that Princeton wasn't the right place for him and that uh, had a desire to actually develop some competency in an area that would be useful to him uh, in business, as I remember particularly. And so he wanted to talk with his father about changing from Princeton and going to another school. And what was the outcome? Uh, the outcome was that uh, 
that his father indicated to him that there were really other plans for his life, that it wasn't important uh, to develop that competency in business, that he could set him up or take care of him in that area, and that, uh, in, in fact, uh, there were other areas uh, that, uh, that he might need to go into, and the contacts and the diploma or the, cert the, the fact he had graduated from Princeton would be more useful to him. Are you aware of any major decisions in Lyle Menendez's life that he had been permitted to make? Did he get to pick the school he went to? No, he didn't. Are you aware of his father uh, picking a girlfriend for him? Yes, I am. Are you aware that his father indicated he had attempted to uh, interfere in various relationships because he didn't approve of the particular girlfriend? Yes. Um, are you aware that Lyle Menendez testified here that he assumed his father would pick a career for him? Yes. And his father would buy a uh, compound in Florida and Lyle would live there? Yes. So now we've, it, I, I was thinking as you were talking, we've taken care of, of career and where you will live and who you, you, who you will marry. Uh, I can't recall uh, any major sort of life decision uh, that Lyle had any significant impact on. Is that a healthy state of affairs for someone who is 21 years of age? No. Is that a mature state of affairs for someone who is 21 years of age? No. He was 21 at the time his parents died, is that correct? Yes. Was he mature for a 21-year-old? No. Was he immature? Yes. What is your opinion with regard to the existence of psychological maltreatment throughout his life? Was there psychological maltreatment? Yes, there is psychological maltreatment throughout uh, his life uh, for the part of his life that I've come to know. And would you characterize it as mild or moderate or severe? Severe. And what is your opinion with regard to the impact of this lifetime of abuse? Uh, that it would have uh, created uh, a person, that Lyle would have become a person who <coughs> did not see resources around him, people that would help him, people that he was truly connected to, that life was a dangerous thing unless you walked uh, a sort of tight wire or rope that had been directed for you, that he didn't have the basic competencies uh, to direct his own life and needed assistance on that, and that he w had not been able to match the standards to be the person that uh, was expected of him, of the person who was the most important one in the world and the most powerful one in his world. Did you find Lyle Menendez to be an angry young man? No, I didn't. Did you find Lyle Menendez to be a young man who loved both of his parents? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. All right, we'll take our recess and we'll resume at uh, 1.30, ladies and gentlemen. Please be back here promptly at 1.30 so that we can start. Uh, I said that yesterday to the uh, blue jury, and uh, needless to say, somebody didn't arrive until 2 o'clock, so uh, we had to wait a half hour for that. So please be back at 1.30 so we can start promptly at that time. Uh, don't discuss the matter with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. We'll see you back here then. With the trial, we have everybody back. And uh, now cross-examination. Dr. Hart, you've done a lot of research in child development. Is that correct? Uh, research in the area of uh, psychological maltreatment, yes, and children's rights. But part of um, psychological maltreatment of children Depend, you have to have a knowledge of childhood development in to order to understand how the maltreatment affects the child, correct? Yes, that's yeah. right. And do you have an opinion as to at what age an adult is responsible for his own life and his own actions? Well, legally, uh, an adult is responsible, I believe, in most states at 18. In terms of the age at which uh, the person can be considered to be 
fully responsible uh, depends a lot on what's happened to them, whether that person is truly capable of being responsible for his or her acts. There are 14-year-olds who are capable of being more responsible than 35-year-olds, but the law doesn't uh, make those distinctions as I understand it. Wouldn't you agree that there are probably 35-year-olds who are not as capable as others of making adult decisions? And, and into the later years, correct? Certainly, yes. All right, so um, you don't have a set age in your mind as to when someone should be um, responsible for their own life and their own action? Uh, well, uh, it would be preferable uh, that they become responsible as they move into their uh, more and more responsible throughout adolescence as they become an adult. But in terms of a set age at which you can be sure that any particular individual uh, can be totally, uh, is, is capable of being responsible for all of his or her acts, no, there's no age that, w that could be chosen in that sense. Do you believe that child abuse excuses adult conduct? Uh, it, it explains uh, adult conduct in many ways. It certainly would be a major contributor uh, to adult conduct in many ways. Do you think that childhood abuse should excuse legally criminal behavior? That, that would be a decision I think a jury would have to make in determining whether that contribution of that child abuse uh, was such that it would create the likelihood of a particular act which would be understandable. Well, in terms of your own, motiv your own personal motivations, your own personal beliefs, do you think that every human being who testifies in a court is going to be somewhat subject to their own personal opinions and personal beliefs? Oh, that everyone who testifies gives testify or, or testifies is subject to their own personal beliefs and experiences? Y yes. Yes, definitely. Okay. Even someone who's an expert witness? Well, yes, certainly. Okay, and so my question to you is, do you um, have a personal belief that uh, an abusive childhood should excuse criminal behavior of an adult? You know, my point of view would be that there are circumstances under which uh, a child's experiences have been uh, so destructive uh, that they would place that child in a situation in which uh, he or she might act to protect themselves, in which uh, that would be justified to protect themselves. Well, that would be true of any person who's acting in self-defense, correct? I assume, yes. All right. So aside from instances where a child would be acting in self-defense, do you personally believe that childhood maltreatment should excuse criminal conduct? No, my, my, my point of view would be that it can explain uh, the criminal conduct, or at least it can make a major contribution to it in many cases. Uh, I think that then a judgment must be made about whether or not uh, that act is an act that would follow from those experiences and the degree to which the person had a choice in that. Did you hear Dr. Burgess's explanation about the neurobiological responses to fear? I think I heard just a little bit of that. I wasn't in the court uh, the full time that she gave that. I think I heard some of the, the last phases of that and maybe some of your cross examination of that. I think you were here for all of my cross examination of hers, weren't you? I'm not absolutely sure if I was always in the room or not, but uh, I, I heard some of it, certainly. Okay. Now, the neurobiological response to fear, is, to fear, is that something to which you subscribe? Uh, that's something I really don't know very much about. The, uh, I've read a little of the material available, and it seems to follow logically from the knowledge base of uh, stress, human stress, that you lower thresholds uh, for certain kinds of, of actions and for, certain ki for the, uh, the power of anxiety. Uh, but beyond that, I couldn't say much about it. Now, I believe I asked you, and I'm going to ask you again, do you think that a person's, that abusive behavior towards a child, do you personally believe that abusive behavior towards a child excuses criminal conduct? Your Honor, I'm going to object this and ask you. Please. All right. Um, let me preface um, my response to the objection by telling the jury that um, I will instruct you on the law, on what is and what is not. Uh, information that the jury can consider in deciding the legal issues and the factual issues in this case. And you must apply the law that I tell you applies in this case. These questions that are being asked are 
being asked only to explore the witness's personal opinions about these matters to uh, test uh, his um, views on uh, subjects to uh, explain um, or uh, deal with his testimony here as far as uh, any um, motive or interest or bias or anything else he might have or attitude he might have uh, in the matter and only for that purpose, not for uh, any legal issues. Those legal issues are things that I instruct you on in the law at the end of the trial. All right. Um, this question has been asked already and the objection is sustained. Well, Dr. Hart, you said it explains criminal conduct, correct? Uh, it, it can explain it, yes. All right, but you are not going to render opinion on whether or not it excuses it. Is that correct? Or that it should excuse it? I'm going to object Has not? Yes. Sustained. Dr. Hart, um, in adding up the number of hours that you've told us about that you spent with various individuals, including Lyle Menendez, it appears that it's in excess of 100 hours that you spent just interviewing people. Would that be fair to say? I think, I think it is in excess of that, yes. And at what rate are you being compensated, please? Well, let's see. I have, will have put in probably 450, 460 hours time in this, and I was paid $5,000 for my involvement, so it, it must be $11, or $12 an hour, something like that, I guess. You were paid $5,000 for your involvement in this yes. case? Yes. And are you getting paid anything for your testimony above and beyond the $5,000? No. And you live in Indiana, is that correct? Indiana. And you're not a medical doctor, are you? No. Okay. I believe you indicated that this case came to you because Ms. Lansing and a colleague of hers approached you personally and um, engaged you in conversation which resulted in you ultimately taking this case, correct? Yes, that's correct. Do you remember who the colleague was that was with Ms. Lansing? Uh, it was a male, and I'm not sure if it was Mr. Burt or if it was somebody else. Okay, so it was not Ms. Abramson? No. Okay. And when you were given information about this case, who was it that provided you with the information that you ultimately took to the consortium? Um, Mrs. Lansing. All right. And when, after the consortium decided to look into this case, who was it that provided you with, with the um, interviews that the police and the defense had conducted? Mrs. Lansing did okay. that, yeah. And when you uh, examined the various people that you interviewed, how did you make arrangements to interview those people? I think that I called all of them myself. I'm trying to remember. Yes, I, yes, I did. Uh, I had uh, a list of, of names of uh, people who in one way or another were part of the family or associated with uh, the case and the phone numbers were there and I believe I called all of them and set the appointments. Who gave you the list of names from which you chose the people you wanted to interview? Uh, Mrs. Lansing did that. Did you on your own seek to identify any other witnesses whose name was not provided to you by Ms. Lansing? In other words, did you say, gee, I think I'd like to see a teacher who's not on this list or a coach who's not on this list? There may have been some conversations about some other teachers. Uh, I, I think I remember something like that. Uh, but uh, I selected uh, the names of, uh, from that list. All right, so that was the list provided to you by Ms. Lansing, correct? Yes. Did you ever look at any family photographs or family memorabilia? Yes, I did. And uh, how many photographs would you say you looked at? Oh. I, I, it would be just a very rough estimate. I w it was uh, maybe one or two books full of photographs, so it might have been uh, upward 50 on up, I suppose, but I don't know how high that may have gone. There were just a lot of them. All right, and who provided you with the photos that you looked at? Uh, Mrs. Lansing. Did you get any information, aside from the people that you directly spoke with, did you get any information from any other sources aside from Ms. Lansing? Aside from the other sources you told us such as well, the police or the prosecution. I had uh, copies of some of the of the police reports, of uh, the interviews and crime scene reports, things like that. Um, those were given to you by by Joe Lansing. Okay. Now you have in, um, to your right, and I'm not sure if you can see it. There's a chart up there called psychological maltreatment. Yes. Okay, and is that a chart that is um, recognized in your profession as um, singling out six specific types of maltreatment? Yes, that's right. 
And who formulated this particular, these particular categories? Yes, those categories were the result of uh, years and years of work, but probably the critical point was when we carried out the research project for the uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, to operationalize uh, definitions, in other words, to clarify um, and, uh, and provide uh, definitions of psychological maltreatment that then could eventually be uh, applied in practice. Uh, the field for a long time had not had uh, clear definitions, and uh, so this was desired. Now, the information that you use to determine whether or not someone has been psychologically maltreated has to be accurate in order for your assessment to be accurate, correct? Certainly, to make a judgment uh, that would, would be accurate, uh, you would want the information that you put into it. And the fact that the information is exaggerated, that would skew your results, right? Uh, if the information were exaggerated, uh, certainly it could, unless you recognized uh, that and took it into consideration. Okay. Did you at any time consider that any of the information given to you by family members of the Menendez family could have been exaggerated to aid the defendants? I, I saw that as, as a possibility. There's always a possibility that anybody involved in, a, in providing information to you uh, might exaggerate if it serves uh, their purposes. Uh, it seemed to me, though, that in fact uh, it was the opposite that tended to happen over and over again, which was that uh, uh, there were things, some things that people didn't want to talk about or that would, would, they would play them down a little bit, maybe give them more strength later on, but uh, that was more of the impression that I got. Now, did you rely in any part upon um, information provided by Marta Cano? Uh, some interviews, yes. Did you personally interview her? No, did I didn't. Okay. Did you read her testimony in this trial? I'm not absolutely sure if I've had a chance to read her testimony or not. Okay. If Marta Cano had testified that um, she had told a lie for Kitty and would tell a lie for, to help someone else out of a bind. Would you consider that a significant in assessing the value of the information she'd give you? If she, if she told me she had lied before and that she lied again? Yes. Uh, yeah, it would be of significance in a number of ways. It, it might mean that what she's providing is uh, information that, uh, that she's made up or that she thinks is going to help somebody. Or it might be that by telling me that, uh, she's uh, being uh, more open and honest about it and that uh, I could put more weight on what she said by telling me that, she's, uh, that she has on occasion done such. Now, as a psychologist, have you received any special training in determining when someone is not telling you the truth? No, I don't uh, think so. Uh, in terms of uh, bits of, of information or, or the description of one incident, the training that I've had as a psychologist uh, that would get at the point of truth is the training that basically is associated with, uh, with reserving uh, judgment when people uh, give you descriptions of their lives, particularly when there are uh, great concerns uh, at issue or that they, these are very important to them and that you don't quickly move to uh, some judgment about whether it's true or not and to apply what is basically a research orientation to gathering information, meaning that it needs to hold together within and that you need, within the set of information you have and that there needs to be uh, corroboration or support for uh, some or much of it uh, for you to give it weight. You think people in the psychology profession can be fooled? Uh, yes, they're, they're human beings and they can be fooled. Have you ever heard of the Rosenhan study? Rosenhan study? Yeah, the Rosenhan study. Uh, that's, is that the study uh, which occurred in which they uh, purposely, uh, people made up uh, symptoms of mental illness and to see if they would be erroneously placed in a, a hospital, a mental hospital? Yes, that yeah. is. That was, um, yes, I, re I remember reading about that years ago. And when you viewed the evidence in this case, did you keep in mind the findings of the Rosenhan study? Well, I, I would certainly keep in mind the possibility that someone uh, could present himself or herself in a way that was deceptive and uh, that there is certainly the possibility if you don't have sufficient information and that and you don't look for corroboration of uh, 
of being fooled. And in fact, in the Rosenhan study, to your recollection, um, did it reveal that psycho people in the psychological profession had been fooled by students who had misrepresented themselves as uh, psychiatric patients? Uh, that's, that's my memory, that they were able to present symptoms uh, that uh, were accepted as indicating that these people had some kind of uh, um, psychiatric disorder. Uh, now that you've d uh, drawn the, p the point, I'd, I'd like to go back to it someday and see if they were psychiatrists or psychologists that were <laughs> the ones reviewing that information. All right, and you're a psychologist, I'm correct? I'm a psychologist, yes. All right. Now, in addition to viewing the information that you got, did you ever consider that it might have been taken out of context? Uh, the information from any particular source, and any bit of information might be taken out of context. There was so much context in this case uh, that um, that didn't seem to be uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, limitations on making judgments about it. In childhood development, what is one of the most important, what is the most important thing that a child needs to develop? The fundamental uh, building block for me uh, is trust. Trust in others, the world, and then eventually trust in yourself. There are lots of things that happen uh, associated with that. What about food? Oh, Children well, need food? Yes. If, if we want to talk about uh, survival, Yes. Uh, and, and to keep your physical system moving in, uh, in, a, uh, in addition to what it takes for healthy development beyond that, certainly food and air and water and shelter, and shelter uh, definitely uh, those, uh, you have to be alive to thrive. And you had no information in this case that, that um, Lyle Menendez was denied any of those essentials, correct? The food and the shelter and the clothing. The only information I had that would have any would have any bearing on that was the information about uh, the denial of, uh, of of food during some of the long tennis practices and some of the diet uh, dietary or uh, diets that the uh, Jose Menendez became enthusiastic about and then applied. I, I I don't know the degree to which those had any real balance in them or not. But in terms of those, aside from those specific instances that have been relayed to you, there was no indication that um, uh, this defendant nor his brother were denied the basic essentials such as food and shelter and basic like physio uh, essentials for physiological survival. Yeah. No. And in fact, in your um, tenure uh, doing child abuse cases, haven't you seen children who were not even provided with food, even though there was food available? Certainly, there are children uh, who have been abused who are not supplied with. Uh, food. I, I guess I, I am now remembering that uh, in addition to being put in his room at night to, to stay there uh, when he was a rather young boy, that uh, there's the indication that he wasn't uh, being given food and that in fact he put food under his pillow uh, so that he'd be sure to have some of that happen. So I suppose you could raise a question about that kind of a situation. Did you see any, any reports, any medical reports that indicated that he had any kind of long-term or short-term effects from being denied food um, over a period of six to ten hours. Did you see anything like that in his medical records? No, I, I didn't see anything like that. I, I think since um, the importance of him becoming a fine athlete was given such high priority that uh, that, that, would, uh, that would have been highly unlikely to find anyhow. Are you familiar with the battered child syndrome? Yes, yes. And the battered child syndrome is a medical diagnosis dealing with the kinds of fractures and injuries one sees to a child who's been continually physically battered over a period of time, correct? That kind of thing, yes. Okay. And uh, did you, uh, battered child syndrome would recognize that certain kinds of breaks to the bones and certain kind of bruising and certain kind of uh -huh. burns yes. would indicate that that child is living in a home where he's continually battered and beaten. Yes, okay. that's right. Did you see any evidence in Lyle Menendez's medical records that he had any kind of, the, of those kinds of batterings? Spiral fractures indicating a twisting of an arm or leg, burns caused by cigarettes being placed on him. Uh, bruises from being continually punched. Excuse me. <clears throat> no, I didn't see that kind of information. He had the scars on his face, but he, I, I don't know of any 
uh, x-rays and so on that would indicate uh, the kinds of conditions you've just described. So you have seen no evidence that he suffered from the battered child syndrome, is that correct? Uh, the physical aspects of it. Well, well, do you understand that the battered child syndrome is in fact a physical diagnosis made yes. by medical doctors? Yes, but now that's been uh, enlarged certainly in the, in the way that people deal with it, recognizing that there are these very strong psychological components. But at, at the time that came out, that was the focus. I, I agree with you. Now, psychological abuse can occur just from people's, the things they say to their children and the things they would withhold from their children, correct? Uh, the, the acts and, and the withholding of, of acts, that's right, uh, conditions that are applied to the child and conditions that are not there. And in addition, if a child is beaten or a child is sexually abused, they will also, there's a psychological component to that because we are thinking creatures, right? Yes. Okay. Is there any way to distinguish symptoms from child abuse to say that this symptom is a symptom of physical, this symptom is a symptom of psychological? and this symptom is a symptom of um, sexual abuse. In other words, are there any psychological symptoms such as bedwetting, nightmares, things like that, which point only to one kind of abuse? Yes. That kind of clarification doesn't really exist. It's being pursued right now. What the developing knowledge base is indicating more and more that uh, what, what uh, that the, the symptoms that are so often associated with physical abuse and sexual abuse, other than the, the broken, bro <laughs> excuse me, broken bones uh, and fractures and so on, are, are psychological symptoms to a large extent and uh, appear to be particularly tied to uh, the psychological abuse that accompanies or is embedded within uh, the physical abuse and the sexual abuse. Okay. You indicated on several occasions during direct examination how um, Lyle Menendez would have felt because of certain behaviors by his parents. Do you remember your, I mean, that's a generic. Uh, yes, how he would have been likely to feel uh, because of those conditions. Did you ever talk to him about how he felt because of those conditions? Yes, we talked about uh, many of his feelings associated with the many conditions uh, that he had. Yeah, I believe you indicated you spent 60 hours interviewing Lyle Menendez, is that correct? Yes. When was the first time that you ever saw him? I'll just take a minute to look, if that's all Certainly, right. Certainly, that's yeah. fine. I have uh, October 21 through 24 of 1992. So, October of 1992, right. is that correct? Your very first contact with him. Yes, that's what I have noted here. It's accurate as far as I can remember. Um, did you request to see any psychological or psychiatric records of Lyle Menendez which predated your first seeing him in October of 92? Yes, well, I've had access, uh, I believe, to uh, the material that was available, and I've had access to the, uh, uh, again, the evaluations of his physical condition and Let's, there was a uh, intelligence test uh, given to him when he was I'm trying to remember three or five. Uh, I'm not remembering anything else in particular. All right, did you get any psychological records for Lyle Menendez before you saw him in October of 92? I don't believe so. I, I did have uh, a, a fair amount of uh, material, but I, I don't remember having any information on psychological evaluations before that date. How about psychological records from having seen a psychologist or a psychiatrist? No, I didn't have those. Okay. Do you know um, if Lyle Menendez was seeing any therapist while he was incarcerated in the county jail before you saw him in October of 1992? While he was incarcerated? Yes. I don't remember having any information about seeing a therapist while he was incarcerated. <laughs> okay. Do you know what he was doing between March of 1990 and October of 1992 when you saw him? Do you know what his daily activities were? Do you know what he was doing in custody? Within the jail itself? Yes. yes. Uh, no, I don't remember having a detailed uh, material on that. Do you know what kind of books he was reading during the period of time before you saw him while he was incarcerated? 
I don't, I don't think I have had, have had any information on the books he was reading during that time. And when you interviewed him, you didn't interview him in, in his cell. You interviewed him in an interview room that was away from his cell, which is where he was living, correct? That's right, in quite a variety of spots, in fact, in the jail. But right. not in his cell. Never in his cell. Never in his cell. Okay, so you were not, uh, you couldn't go and look and see what kind of reading material he had in his cell, right? No, I couldn't. That's right. And did you consider the reports of Dr. Ozeal in assessing uh, Lau Menendez? The, I had some information on those reports uh, in, I'm, I'm trying to remember when I had access to those, and I watched a little bit of the testimony on tape of Dr. Ozeal. I uh, looked at some of the testimony uh, that was in transcript, and Yeah, I, I ended up de deciding that there was uh, there was so many questions about the accuracy of the material and about the motivation associated with that relationship that uh, I didn't give uh, any further attention to it. Are you familiar with Lauman and his testimony in this courtroom? I think I've had access to most of that testimony. Uh, in uh, I, it came to me in in bits and pieces, so I'm not sure whether I missed a segment or not. Well, are you familiar with the fact that in his testimony, he confirmed that many of the things that Dr. Ozeal said, which were beneficial to his case, were in fact said during his sessions with Dr. Ozeal? Are you aware of that fact? I'm not. It's not clear to me what, what you're saying. Well, objection sustained. It calls for a conclusion on the part of the witness. After, here, after reading Lyle Menendez's testimony or the portions of it that yes. were made available to you, did you think that you wanted to go back and look at Dr. Ozeal's notes because of what Lyle Menendez had said about them during his testimony? No, no, I didn't come away with that sense. I believe you indicated that you had an intelligence test for Lyle Menendez from when he was a child. Uh, had the results of an intelligence test, yes. I remember, and, and I'm, I'm having trouble remembering if it was at uh, three or five years of age. Did you do any uh, psychological testing of him? I, I carried out some uh, formal uh, processes to see um, just what his reactions would be. What tests did you give him? I gave him uh, uh, some uh, subtests of the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale. Did you give him the MMPI test? No. Okay. And did you determine whether or not his intelligence was average, above average, below average? What was your determination? Yeah, my, I also gave him the Raven Standard Progressive Matrices. I forgot. The, I'm sorry. Raven's R A V E N S Standard Progressive Matrices. Uh, yes, the the results I got indicated that uh, he was uh, is above average intelli of in, in intelligence, not at the level of that was shown in that early testing but that would place him, depending on the area that you were considering, uh, somewhere uh, from uh, a little above average to uh, maybe in the top uh, 10 to 5 percent, something like that. Top 10, for 10 or 5 percent of the nation in intelligence? Of, of individuals of his age, yes. Now, I believe you indicated then that you rejected Dr. Ozeal's notes, but you did look at the um, psychiatric or psychological notes of Mrs. Menendez, correct? Uh, the notes uh, from therapists or those who had worked with Mrs. Menendez, yes. And you didn't reject those notes, did you? Yes, they didn't have the, uh, the controversy associated with them or the questions, at least to my knowledge. Have you ever had a patient threaten to kill you? I, no, no I haven't. How many people have you interviewed who've been incarcerated in, in um, a jail or a prison for murder? None, uh, until this time. So you have no experience with talking to people who are either charged with or convicted of murder, is that correct? No, that's right. And how about, have you, uh, have you done any studies on, um, or have you ever interviewed people in custody for other crimes, either accused or convicted of other crimes? <laughs> no. Have you ever done any study on the percentage of criminals who lie in order to avoid criminal responsibility? No, I haven't done studies in that area. Okay. So this was the first time you had ever interviewed someone in a, in a jail facility, is that correct? That's right. Yes, it was. I've interviewed lots of people who are dealing with, with a lot of stress and problems in their lives, but not people in 
jail. Okay, would you consider um, a capital case to be a stress-producing event? I would expect it to be. Okay. Now, you indicated that um, you've looked at lots of reports and that those reports help corroborate some of the findings you had pursuant to the chart, which is Exhibit 295. Do you remember testifying that um, it was your information that Mrs. Menendez did not want to have a child when she was pregnant with Lyle Menendez? Yes, that she did not want to have uh, children. All right. Yes, I remember that. Uh, may I approach, please, Your Honor? With what? With it, I showed uh, passing out. All right, yes. Uh, I'm going to show you an interview with Mrs. Faith Goldsmith. I'd like to ask you if this particular interview was made available to you by the defense. I'm not absolutely sure whether I've seen this particular interview before. I have seen interviews with uh, Faith Goldsmith. But you're not sure if the defense I'm, gave you that one? I'm, I'm not absolutely certain that I had this particular one in hand. If, I, if you want me to read through the whole thing, I might be, well, I actually, might have a clearer sense of it. Well, actually, what I'm concerned with is the first line, which I've outlined to you, and I showed you before you started right. testifying. Yes. Okay, and the information contained in there may be um, in conflict with what you, your assumption is about the fact that she didn't want children, correct? Uh, it it could be in conflict if you took this statement to mean that uh, that Kitty uh, truly wanted the child, but the fact that it, should this be read aloud uh, so the people know what we're talking about? Well, there's no objection, so yes. Why don't you read the yeah. part in pink? Okay, this says Lyle was, a, and this would be then from uh, Faith Goldsmith. Lyle was a planned pregnancy. Kitty and Jose would say they wanted a child. Uh, and that could be in conflict, or it could simply mean that Jose wanted a child, and therefore Kitty would say that she wanted the child because what Jose wanted is what Kitty would be probable uh, would probably indicate uh, was what she wanted, whether it meant that or not. Well, you couldn't ask Mrs. Menendez if she truly wanted to be pregnant because she's not with us anymore, correct? <laughs> No, that's certainly true. And you're aware of the fact that Mrs. Goldsmith testified in this court that she, during a certain period of time, she and her husband were best friends with the Mr. and Mrs. Menendez. That's my understand. <coughs> Excuse me. That's my understanding. And in fact, um, they knew Mr. and Mrs. Menendez before Mrs. Menendez even became pregnant with Lyle Menendez. Correct? That's my understanding. And so. Are you saying that you're rejecting the information contained in the report that Kitty said she wanted to become pregnant, or are you finding another way of explaining it? No. What I'm saying is that, uh, that for someone to say that Kitty said to them uh, that she wanted to have a child would not necessarily mean that she wanted to have a child. And a person saying they didn't want to have a child doesn't necessarily mean they don't want to have a child, does it? No, you'd look uh, for many other things. And probably there are many women who have not wanted to have a child or who have shifted in and out of that feeling. So then you would start to look at their behavior relative uh, to that child to see if it was wanted. Are you familiar with this book that I'm holding up, which is called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders? Yes. OK, and this particular uh, book is this, in fact, a compendium of all different kinds of mental disorders and diseases? Yes, that's right. And in order for something to be classified as a disorder <clears throat> or disease, isn't the way it becomes one, is it a, a group of psychologists and psychiatrists vote on whether or not that thing should be a, considered a disorder or disease? It, it is that sort of process. They've added a little more strength to it uh, recently in that they do some field studies to see that uh, that which they have agreed on or inclined to agree on seems to actually work out in practice in some sense. But I, I think that you're right in terms of the, uh, the general. All right. In fact, isn't it true that there are certain kinds of diseases and disorders which are periodically added in and removed from this particular manual? That's right, yes. Okay. So this is sort of like the Syndrome Hall of Fame, is that correct? Sort of a, it's kind of a handbook, yes. Uh, it, it isn't uh, comprehensive, but it uh, does provide you with a lot of useful information about, um, about conditions. And the reason that this book came about is because psychologists needed some way of unifying their knowledge so that they'd know what each other was talking about, right? Exactly. OK, now, one of the things that's contained in this particular book is a, a term called malingering. Yes. Are you familiar I, with the term yes, malingering? Yes, I am. All right, now, um, you understand that the 
essential feature of malingering is a production of false or grossly exaggerated symptoms uh, motivated by external ex incentives such as avoiding military conscription, which is the draft, avoiding work, obtaining financial compensation, evading criminal prosecution, et cetera, et cetera. You understand that concept, right? Yes, uh, that what they're dealing with there is the production, the creation falsely of symptoms or an exaggeration of them. And they're referring to uh, uh, physical symptoms, uh, problem using limbs, problems of, uh, of movement and so on, all kinds of physical symptoms. They're talking also about uh, psychological uh, <coughs> symptoms in terms of uh, things like having hallucinations, uh, uh, having uh, being so confused uh, that you, you can't deal with everyday problems and so on. The, uh, the focus is on symptoms, that's correct. All right. So a, a very basic form of malingering is I don't want to go to school when I'm a child and I tell my mother I have a stomach ache. Yeah, that's, that's a very simple form. I think that's form. a good example that all of us uh, can appreciate. Okay. Now, um, do you know what a forensic psychologist is? Uh, it's my understanding that a forensic psychologist is someone who specializes in doing evaluations and making judgments in regard to uh, the cases that uh, are going toward or are in court. And forensic psychologists then interview people who are in custody, right? I would uh, think that that would, yes, certainly. And they interview people who are involved in lawsuits who are trying to obtain certain results from their lawsuits, correct? Yes, I would okay. think so. And you are not a forensic psychologist? No, that's not my specialty. Did you suspect malingering in this case? Uh, I was not really dealing with symptoms and exaggerated symptoms as a major part of this case. Uh, what I did consider that is associated with the idea of malingering is uh, whether or not uh, the information I was getting was information that was uh, fabricated, that was not true. And so I, I definitely gave consideration to that in terms of looking at the degree to which what I heard from Lyle Menendez uh, was internally consistent as we approached it in a variety of ways, whether the information that uh, was provided to me or that I was able to gather by going through reports and interviewing people uh, indicated that such things, things like this had happened or that the parents behaved in ways that would mean uh, that this was uh, something that could be believable. So I certainly uh, was concerned about that all the way through this process, but not about symptoms. Do you ever consider the idea that the tales that you were told by Lyle Menendez were false or grossly exaggerated? I considered the possibility that they were, but uh, the information I had uh, suggested that that was unlikely. Now, I believe one of the things that you were told by Lyle Menendez was sexual abuse by his father. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's right. And one of the ways, now, as far as the particular incident occurring, the only two witnesses would have been Lyle Menendez and his deceased father, correct? Uh, to be present, uh, to observe uh, the sexual abuse, yes, uh, that, that's my understanding. I don't know of anybody who had a chance to observe that occurring and then possibly his mother too would have knowledge of it but as you've indicated as we both know she is not any longer here i believe he did talk to a, a cousin and about it and to uh, a an acquaintance donovan goudreau okay now did you see mr goudreau testify last week no i did i didn't see him uh testify uh, so, last week so you don't know where he got his information do you where Mr. Donna Goudreau got his information. You don't know for certain where Mr. Goudreau got his information because you didn't see him testify in court last week, correct? No, I don't know for certain where he got his information. Now, the cousin was Diane Vandermolen. Is that the cousin? That's my got? understanding, yes. Okay. Right, did you read the testimony of Diane Vandermolen? I, I believe I have read the testimony of uh, Diane. Okay, Randy and Martin. are you aware of the fact that the information she gave which corroborates the sexual abuse was not given to the defense attorneys until their second interview with her? Are you aware of that fact? Yes. And are you aware of the fact that the information she gave to the defense attorneys wasn't given it to them until she'd been to visit Lyle Menendez, I think, on three occasions in the county jail? Are you aware of that fact? Uh, yes, I am aware of that, uh, that it was my understanding that they, those were under conditions in which that kind of communication would be unlikely to occur, uh, but that is, uh, that is my understanding. Did you have private conversations with Lyle Menendez in the jail? 
Yes, uh, most of the conversations could be considered to have been private. There was uh, at least one occasion on which uh, you could question whether that was private, and that's when I was in the setting that I think is available for most visitations when you have the phone and you're talking to the person on the other side, you've got somebody sitting beside you, uh, the person you're talking to uh, may have somebody sitting beside him. Uh, that was the only time that I uh, felt that uh, there was a real question about whether we could talk confidentially or not. That occurred just on one day when uh, the, pro the necessary paperwork uh, wasn't in existence. Dr. Hart, do you think people would lie to help themselves? Do you think that's a part people, of human... People uh, do lie to help themselves when they get in, uh, in very tight places. Would you consider being tried for a capital offense to be a tight place? Certainly. And do you think people lie to help those they love? I think people do lie to help those they love. Have you ever found in your evaluation of anyone as a psychologist that you felt that th that person was malingering? Was uh, creating, generating symptoms or not telling the truth? Well, malingering is it's used in the DSM, which is creating symptoms. Did you ever think someone was telling you about symptomology? Um, yes, there, there were occasions in which I felt that the person was exaggerating and uh, desperately needing attention and uh, that sort of thing was happening, yes. Was that person incarcerated? No, not in a jail. Okay. Can psychologically abused children hate their parents? That psychologically abused children can hate their parents, yes. And wouldn't you, I mean, there are lots of people who hate their parents, correct? I'm not sure how many there are. There are lots of people who at one time or another hate their parents, and there are some who hate their parents uh, pretty consistently. All right. And so um, psychological abuse can be one of the origins of hating your parents, correct? <clears throat> that psychological abuse could contribute to hating your parents. That's right. And can psychologically abused children make plans to kill their parents? Yes, psychologically abused children, uh, some of them would be capable of making plans to kill their parents. Did you diagnose any kind of mental disease or defect in Lyle Menendez? In other words, did he have any kind of mis disorder or defect that would impair his ability to think? Uh, he didn't have any uh, sort of clinical syndrome. I, I did not, I wasn't asked to make that kind of an evaluation, but I didn't see any signs of that sort of thing. Uh, but he certainly uh, had li life experiences and had exhibited uh, problems in, in problem solving and in thinking associated with those life experiences. Uh, but not uh, to the point of being or not fitting uh, some clinical syndrome that I have knowledge of. Do you know what a sociopath is? Sustain. Did you ever consider that he had any kind of um, personality disorder um, in your evaluation of him? I gave that consideration, yes. Did you reject that idea? Yes. Now, if two children are raised in the same home, but are by the same set of parents, but are raised very differently. Would you expect them to have the same sort of psychological reactions? They could have quite different ones and, and the same. Uh, it could be a combination of those two. Okay, but, um, you're aware of the fact that in, in families, for instance, uh, a family with several children, one of them will become a criminal and the others won't. Yes. Okay, and you're aware of the fact that in families, um, that the children might all be treated the same, but they all may come out differently, correct? Well, it, it, we believe often that, fam that children are all created the same because they're in the same family. That isn't really so, so often the case. Usually children are treated differently within a family for a whole variety of reasons. The time when they come along uh, in that family, how that family has changed over those periods, the characteristics that person brings. Uh, but, uh, and so those could be some of the conditions that would, uh, would lead to them uh, being quite different in the way they, they develop. But then children also uh, are, uh, who appear to be treated in, in much the same way because of the uh, differences in their talents, temperament, and so on, and conditions outside the home 
um, it could turn out quite differently. I believe you indicated that um, when you interviewed Lyle Menendez, he did not show any hatred towards his parents. Is that correct? That's correct. He didn't show hatred toward his parents. Did you ever consider that by showing you hatred, um, that that would play into the prosecution's theory that this was a killing done out of hatred, and that that kind of that he didn't want to give you that kind of support when he interviewed with you? I, I consider the possibility that that showing hatred might be considered to um, to have somehow uh, led to and contributed to the crime, uh, but the. The fact that uh, again approach from so many different directions and was so and and the fact that it was genuinely expressed uh, that the, his continuing love uh, for his parents and the fact that others that, who knew him and had heard him speak about his parents over and over again uh, had not found this evidence of hatred uh, uh, led me to the conclusion that uh, that that was not a major factor. You said his emotions were genuinely expressed, is that correct? Yes, to the degree that you can read someone's emotions while you're talking to them. Have you ever been to a movie where the acting was so moving that you reacted emotionally even though the story wasn't true? Yes, I certainly have. You think you can be fooled, Dr. Hart? Uh, could I be fooled yeah. uh, by, by something like that? Uh, well, I've certainly been moved by movies, you think by you people who didn't feel that, and someone uh, could probably um, uh, get me to believe that something was very important to them. They had a strong emotional reaction if, uh, if we only dealt with that topic on one occasion and I didn't have other information about it. Did you, did you hear or did you read the testimony of Lyle Menendez that he is the one responsible for the contact wound to his, the back of his father's head? I believe that I read that testimony that I came with. Well, are you aware of the fact that Lyle Menendez is responsible for the contact wound to the back of his father's head? Yeah, that's my understanding. Do you consider that an act of love? Uh, I consider that uh, to be an act that uh, was produced by years of developing fear and uh, that the cont contributions of the psychological maltreatment were the major driving forces there with the fear uh, and that love at that point was pushed out of the way. Do you ever consider the fact that he might have planned the killing of his parents? I, I did give thought to that, yes, consideration to whether that might have been a part of what happened. Now, you indicated in your testimony that, uh, in your opinion, Lyle Menendez loved his father, correct? Yes. Did you look at the fact that within four days after killing his father, he went out and bought a watch of which his father disapproved? Yes, I did. I, did. I had that information. Okay, and did yeah. you also have the information uh, that he, f in fact, wore the watch to his father's funeral in Princeton. Uh, the, yes, I, I, I knew that. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I knew wh what watch. I think he bought more than one, and I remember that he called his uncle to see if he thought that would be appropriate uh, to wear a watch to the funeral. Uh, I'm not. It's not clear to me which watch he ended up wearing. Do you consider that an, an act of respect for one you love to go out four days after you've killed them and buy an object of which they disapproved? Uh, I didn't think, in a sense, it might actually be tied in with the love he had for his father because uh, the meaning I gave to that seemed to be most uh, to fit best was uh, that it, he had this strong love for his father and the conditions that had been pre produced meant that he had lost his father. He no longer had this person he loved and I think there was some, uh, some anger being expressed at that point for not having it, that his father was no longer around, that he had ended up in this situation without this father who uh, directed, guided uh, so much of his life and was so important to him. Wouldn't it be more an act of respect and love to wear his father's watch after he was dead than to go out and buy a $9,000 Rolex? Uh, that could be uh, shown as an act of love. That, that's right. Uh, if it wasn't, uh, if, if the interpretation I gave uh, didn't make more sense to me, and I, I have no knowledge of his father's watch or his, uh, even its existence, so I don't know whether that was any kind of choice, but I think there was the other kind of motivation was what was involved. Did you consider it an act of love and respect when he went out and bought a $70,000 Porsche after his father's death? 
Uh, I consider that to be just an extension of what had been a lifelong pattern of not uh, giving any real value to money and to uh, just continuing to spend. Well, you're aware of the fact that he had a car at the time of his father's death, correct? Yes, yes, I believe so. What about the contact wound to his mother on her cheek? Did you consider that an act of love? No, I'd have the same interpretation of that, that that was an extension of, of the fear and the, uh, the contribution of the, the psychological maltreatment he'd experienced. I believe you indicated one of the things that you found to be corrupting about the family was the fact that the um, parents did the homework for their children and that, that, was, that they were teaching them to cheat. Is that correct? Well, it was corrupting in, uh, in that way because you have these people who are the ones kind of guiding you through life. This is the way you do things, cheating openly for you. And you also, it's corrupting in that it's denying the person the opportunity to develop some of the competencies he ought to be developing in that case. The work habits, uh, the, the fuller understanding of the material, uh, to be able to then carry himself through other parts of his life where he will be expected to actually do things on his own. Uh, so it's, it's corrupting at least in those two ways. Have you have done any studies on the percentage of professional athletes who cheated in order to get through school? No, I haven't done any studies in that area. Do you think that all of the athletes at Indiana University and Purdue University do their own schoolwork? I don't, I can't really make a judgment of, about that. I think that probably, from what I've heard about, I mean, this is just speculation about the, the way that athletes in different universities no, and they're helped, it's... It's speculation. So the answer is you don't know whether or not professional, excuse me, the athletes at the schools at which you teach do all of their own work, correct? I don't know whether those athletes do all of their own work, part of their own work, none of their own work. Okay. I believe you indicated one of the factors you found compelling was the fact that Lyle Meninas had no independence, that he was co totally controlled. But he had by such a, a low level of independence, <laughs> of a, autonomy, that's right. Are you aware of the fact that in 1986 his family moved to California and left him behind in Princeton to live on his own? <laughs> yes, he was left behind uh, initially, I think, living in the family home and with the uh, uh, contacts with his relatives, with the frequent telephone calls and the visits, and also probably with a high level of confidence mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, which had been established earlier than when Lyle had some particular need and when he came up against something you couldn't handle that he was going to call home because you knew that you needed to clear things in that family. Are you aware of the fact that in the fall of 1987 he attended Princeton University and lived on the Princeton campus? Fall of 1987, yes. And that is normal behavior for someone of that age to go to college and live on campus, correct? There's nothing abnormal about that, correct? About living on campus? Yes. Uh, no. All right. Now, are you also aware of the fact that during, between 1987 and 1989, that he went to Europe twice without his parents? Yes. You're aware of the fact that he traveled to Australia to play tennis? Yes. Okay, and one of the trips to Europe was a trip with his girlfriend, Jamie. Were you aware of that? Yes, that's right. I understand that. All right, and so when he was on this trip in Europe, he was away from his parents. Yes, uh, he, in, in truth, I don't think there was ever a time when Lyle could be away from his parents because he would be carrying them in his head and his feelings all the time. But physically, he was away from his parents. That's right. Do you consider traveling alone in Europe without your parents to be, to be an act of independence? Uh, he was traveling with somebody. With his girlfriend. He? Yes, that's right. And he was um, making his way by stringing rackets or something like that. Uh, so that, and, and that was a case in which uh, Yes, he was showing some independence. We were of the fact that during the period of time after 1986, when he was no longer living permanently with his family, that he had a family credit card with a $250,000 credit limit. I 
think I was under the I was under the impression that he actually had a family credit card uh, even before that, that that was one of the ways that he took care of uh, buying the things that he needed to, and uh, which also doesn't require that you actually take care of money, that you're responsible for money. You just have that card and you use it. Do you consider that to be abuse to give your child a credit card with a two hundred fifty thousand dollar limit? Is that child abuse? To have given them that. Uh, card, uh, it's probably, it's, it's giving them something that uh, they haven't been very well prepared to use and which on occasion, as my understanding, he would overspend. Uh, and on the surface, it looks like uh, an act of generosity, I suppose. Uh, but uh, what you buy with your credit card can be checked on and uh, in Lyle's life, uh, there was uh, the sure knowledge uh, that if you stepped very far beyond any particular line, you were going to come up against a wall. So uh, in, in that case, he generally probably could be uh, um, allowed to have such a card. So it was abusive? What, was in and it? of itself, uh, no, it's not abusive to give him that credit card. Were you aware of the fact that while he was at Princeton University, he had a vehicle to use? I believe I knew that. I had not really thought much about it. But. So the fact that he was at Princeton University, 3,000 miles away from his parents' home, that he had a credit card that he could use to take care of his needs, that he could sign at the student store yes. to take care of his needs, and he had a vehicle and was living at times with a woman named Jamie Pizarsik, of whom his parents did not approve, that yes. was not independence. Is that correct? Well, he was always tied closely uh, to his mother and father in regard to what he was doing. There were certain areas in which they allowed him uh, some freedom of movement, but which they uh, could, uh, to which they could apply control when they wanted to. One of the areas, uh, at least from his father, was some freedom uh, with his girlfriends, uh, even though his mother, uh, you know, was strongly critical of them. Uh, but uh, yes, that, that's my understanding. But there was. There are so many instances in which someone was checking on him or he was checking back at home to see that what he was doing was okay, that I would, I would not consider him uh, to be a free agent under that, that situation or to be um, <coughs> displaying autonomy uh, to the degree uh, that, or independence that you would expect for a university student. Was there any physical or legal reason that Lyle Menendez couldn't have just told his father to keep his money and he could go off and get a job as a tennis pro at a country club somewhere. Was there any reason he couldn't do that? Object vague as to time. Sustained. After 1986, when he was 18 years old and his parents had moved to California and he was on the East Coast, was there any physical or legal reason that you could find in your evaluation which pre prevented Lyle Menendez from telling his father to take his money and Lyle would go live his own life? Uh, there, excuse me. There was no legal reason, and there's no physical reason, uh, and, unless you consider the possibility of some kind of physical punishment uh, from his father, or some uh, or being in, in danger of some, in, physically in danger from some act from his father, or you consider the uh, this bio or uh, psychological, neurological sort of of interaction that you were referring to earlier. But that isn't, uh, those are not the, the conditions that would be most powerful in limiting Lyle Menendez's freedom to make that choice. The conditions that would be most powerful in his life were those that, uh, that he had lived with for, for so long that indicated his father was a power to be reckoned with well beyond uh, his capabilities and that he needed to do what his father wanted and that there really was uh, no way of escaping his father unless he was willing not to be considered his father's son, the, uh, this person important in his father's life. And that was uh, you know, one of the uh, things of greatest priority to him. Dr. Hart, my question to you was whether or not there was a physical or legal reason which prevented him from telling his father to take his money and he'd go on his way. You added in a great many yes. words after answering the question. Is there a reason that you did that? Yes, we got, I thought it was important to understand uh, the factors that actually would keep him from making that choice rather than the ones that would ordinarily be considered uh, without going into any depth in the matter. 
Are you an advocate for either side? For are either you an advocate, side? Are you an advocate for La Menendez? I'm an advocate for children in general. Uh, in regard to La Menendez, I'm an advocate of uh, the truth of uh, being a participant and seeing that uh, justice is done, that his life is sufficiently understood so that those people who are going to make a decision about him will be able to take that into consideration. What if you weren't told the truth? Would that make a difference in your opinion as to your advocacy for Lau Menendez? If I were not told the truth and knew I had not been told the truth, then I would not Present, not be presenting that information. Uh, I would not. I would not automatically be an advocate uh, for him or, or, not, or for or against him. Did you consider? Did you talk to Lyle Menendez about the acts the week of his parents' killings? Did you talk to him about those events? We talked about that week. Yes. All right. And did you talk to him about the actual killing of his parents? Yes, we talked about those events, too. Were you aware of the fact that when he called the police on the, during the 911 call that he lied to the police? They asked him, are the people there that did this? And he said, they're gone. Yes, I, I remember it that way, too. OK, you remember the fact that he lied to the police while under what he would say was a great deal of stress, correct? Uh, well, I. I'm going to assume that he was under stress and continued to be under stress after that, yes. Would you say he would have been under stress even if he'd planned to kill his parents? Uh, I would think he would be under a great deal less stress uh, and maybe not much. It would, uh, I wouldn't be able to gauge exactly the amount, but I would, it would be my judgment that he would be under less, uh, a lower degree of stress if he had planned it uh, than if it had uh, happened as described. Do you, are you aware of the fact that when Lyle Menendez talked to the police shortly after the 911 call that he lied to the police as well about his participation in the killings of his parents? Are you aware of that fact? I don't remember the exact words, but uh, he certainly didn't tell them that he participated. Well, you understand he told them he'd gone to a movie that he hadn't gone to. Yes, yes, I'm remembering that. Yes. And you remember that he also told the police that if the murder had anything to do with his parents' associates, it would have been his father's business associates because they were seedy people. Do you remember that? Well, I, re I remember in his testimony that he uh, mentioned from time to time other possibilities. But uh, my reading of it was that he usually, if not always, sort of discarded those then after having mentioned them uh, as he would <laughs> sort of throw this idea and that idea out. Are you aware of the fact that after the killings of his parents, he hired bodyguards and that to he told one of the bodyguards that the mafia had done the killing? Yes, I, I think I, w I was aware of all that information, uh, which uh, to me uh, even f sort of strengthened the idea that, uh, that he was concerned about the possibility that, that he might have said something that might have been misunderstood to to point a finger in that direction, and that, that might somehow mean that uh, he was in trouble. Did you ever con Excuse me. Your Honor, could we approach for a minute? Yes. Dr. Hart, you're aware of the fact that Lyle Menendez lied to a number of individuals after his parents' killings, correct? Are you aware of that fact or not? I'm, I, yeah, I'm aware of the fact that he did not uh, tell the truth about what had happened to a number of individuals. Yeah. And in fact, he didn't, well, strike that. Did you consider that the fact that he lied about his participation in the killings in order to avoid being caught? Did you consider that as a possibility? That he lied afterward about what he had done in, in order that he would not be caught and not go to, to jail for this? Certainly I did, yes. All right. Now, did you ever consider that he might lie to you so that you would help him avoid responsibility for the crime? Yes, I considered that possibility, and I took that into consideration when I looked at all the different types of information that I had. And you rejected that, is that correct? Yes, that's now, right. Now, are you aware of the testimony in this case by Lyle Menendez and his brother Eric Menendez about the fact that the reason they had to go to San Diego to purchase the guns is because they'd gone to the Big Five in Santa Monica and they couldn't buy handguns there? Yes, I am aware of that material, that, that testimony. Yeah. And are you aware of the fact that that particular store didn't even really sell handguns? 
That's my understanding, that it didn't have handguns that use uh, bullets. Uh, it might have had handguns that were pellet guns, many of which look, to me at least, they look just like the other guns. But I, beyond that, I have no idea of what, uh, what they have in a big five store. Do you think maybe he just lied about the fact that he went to the Big Five in order to try to explain why he'd end up in San Diego with false identification buying shotguns two days before the murders? Uh, well, Did you consider that a possibility? The possibility that he might have lied about that to give justification for going to San Diego. Correct. That, that didn't make much sense to me as a, a lie that would be very useful to anybody, so I, I didn't give much weight to it. I believe you indicate, okay, let me just ask you this. Is there any fact about the, the murders, the killings themselves, or the week before the killings that is inconsistent with your version that Lyle Menendez is telling the truth? Is there anything that you know about what happened before, during, and after the killings which is inconsistent with your idea of why, why Lyle Menendez did this? Uh, no, there, there isn't any fact of, of any significance that comes to my mind or has that doesn't make sense within the context of what I've come to understand about uh, his life. So every single fact that you know about the homicide before and after makes sense within your own um, understanding of the psychological factors, yeah, yes, correct? Yes, is understandable within, those, uh, within that set of information. That's right. I believe you indicated at the end of your direct examination that um, you considered this Lyle Menendez's case to be severe psychological abuse. Is that correct? Yes, yes, that's right. Did you ever consider the fact of his behavior when he was a child? In other words, did you ever consider that maybe he was naughty as a child on occasion? No, certainly, yes. Uh, most children are on occasion. Okay. Did you ever consider the fact that the information being given to you was given to you and it was all bad. Did you ever think, gee, we're, there's nothing good here? Uh, the information about what? The information given to you by the defense attorney, the, the friends, the relatives, the information from Lyle Menendez, all of it gave very negative information about the parents, correct? Well, there was some information that wasn't uh, negative about the parents and some that was sort of a borderline. It had many different meanings to it. Did you, do you consider someone who's been severely psychologically ab abused capable of becoming a um, superior tennis player? Uh, certainly. And do you yeah. think someone who's been severely psychologically abused can attend a university like Princeton? Yes. Okay. Do you think a person who's been severely psychologically abused can plan to and execute a plan to kill their parents? Is it possible for someone uh, to do that kind of planning? Yes. Uh, it would depend on the nature of the psychological abuse uh, that they had experienced. Uh, for some, it would be possible. Uh, for those who have, uh, who have little to no confidence in their ability to do that kind of planning, uh, it, would become, uh, or it would become less likely. Now, you say this was a severe case. Uh, have you ever analyze children who've been used as child prostitutes? No, I don't believe that I have. Would you consider a child being sold into prostitution a severe form of psychological abuse? I would consider it uh, to be a, a severe form of abuse uh, and, and certainly would have strong psychological abuse uh, elements within that. Um, ch have you ever interviewed or examined a child who's been locked in a closet in their parents' house for three, four, five years, and the neighbors didn't even know there was a child living at the house. Have you ever had that kind of situation? No, that uh, would also be a severe form. You think that's abuse. severe psychological yes. abuse? All right. Do you think that children who are beaten on a <coughs> daily or a weekly basis are subject to severe psychological abuse as a result of their beatings? Yes, yes, they would be. Have you ever interviewed children or seen children who have sores on their bodies because they live in a home that has two feet of trash on the ground? Well, I don't know about the amount of trash on the ground, but I've seen those kinds of sores, yes. Have you ever seen children who were starved? <coughs> I've seen children who were underfed uh, directly. I've certainly seen uh, material on children who were starved. 
And this is severe psychological abuse, is that correct, Lyle Menendez's case? Uh, oh yes, this is severe psychological abuse uh, for a great number of factors. The sheer mass of the incident, the fact that they went across all age levels, uh, the fact that uh, all of the different uh, forms of psychological abuse are represented, uh, the, uh, the extremes of some of those, uh, the pervasive nature of them, uh, and, and uh, for many other reasons too. Do you feel it necessary to justify your position by including these things in your answers? Oh, I thought you were wanting me to tell you why I thought it was severe psychological maltreatment. No, thank you, Doctor. I'm looking All right, let's take our recess and we'll resume promptly at 3.15. Don't discuss the matter with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. We'll see everybody back here at 3.15. And the jury is back and we'll resume with the examination of the witness. This will be redirect examination. Thank you. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mrs. Bazanich asked you a number of questions about whether you believed the information that you were told by Lau Menendez. Yes. Was the accuracy or the reliability of that information something that was of concern to you? Yes, it was uh, throughout the process. And what steps did you take to try to determine that that information you were receiving was accurate? Uh, well, first of all, to make sure that in all the ways that it was approached in communicating with Lyle, uh, that uh, it was consistent, held together in all the different ways he might describe his life or tell me about incidents and situations. And then uh, certainly to look at the information that was available uh, from interviews uh, and that was produced by my interviews uh, that would describe uh, conditions under which someone had seen uh, some of these conditions in his life or had knowledge of them, uh, direct knowledge through observation, or had information about uh, Lyle's parents uh, that would indicate uh, whether or not they were people who might behave in such a manner. If you excluded from your consideration everything that Lyle Menendez personally told you and relied only on the testimony that was presented in this court, the witness interviews that you read, the witness interviews you conducted, the medical records, the school records, the psychiatric records, would you be able to make a determination as to whether he had been psychologically maltreated during the course of his life? Yes, the information that was available from other sources indicated that uh, that that was the that he had experienced psychological maltreatment. Uh, a fuller understanding of it uh, was gained by having his perspectives to uh, his experiences as he told them. Do you testify in court uh, for a living? No. Have you ever testified in a criminal case before? No. Have you worked very hard to gain respect among your colleagues in the community in which you work? I, I believe I have, yes. And do you have an international reputation? Uh, yes. Would you be here testifying if you didn't believe the information was accurate? Uh, no, I wouldn't be here testifying to, to the to my opinion as I've given it to the information provided if I didn't believe it. Uh, uh, as you said, I've worked a long time uh, to become a person that people can rely on and who can help people to understand uh, the treatment that children experience. And to be able to do that, uh, you have to deal with information honestly and as objectively as you can. Is that what you've done here? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. Dr. Hart, um, Lyle Menendez did discuss with you, did we not, the events not only leading up to, but the events of the killings of his parents, correct? It, we discussed those events, yes. And you took that into account in judging his believability, is that correct? Yes, I did. And after considering everything he told you, you still believed him, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing further. Thank you. Excuse.